last year. What room is this? What uh, room is this one? Oh, not what? What? I have no idea which is what's in what room. So I <laughs> just like. It's quiet, but it works. So is them. We are going to send it to you and also, all right, check, check, check. Hey, hey, it does look like we're getting it. Is that us? Check, check. Yep. It's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, so we changed to an auto mix on the Zoom. That's why we wanted to test it. Yeah, that is fine. You are welcome to do what you need to do in the room. Dylan, go ahead and talk for us. Testing, testing, one, two, three, can you hear me? Yes, we can. That sounds great. Anything else, Tim? All right, we're good. On to Pembroke. See you in Pembroke.
Hey, Dylan. Excellent. Can you say hi? Hello, hello, testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. That's it. Two, two, one, two. Two, 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 one, two.
And what I really want to focus on here actually is like, I'm, the assumption behind this talk is, or be, behind this discussion is that from uh, day zero, we're not gonna have all these features. That's the assumption. And so it's really, this, this talk should almost be titled like how do we roll out new confidential VM features in a way that we don't break things or cause problems. And so here I just have some like concrete examples. So like live migration, like most of these features, they require code in the host, the guest firmware and the guest kernel. So given that, like what could go wrong here if, 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 if a customer thinks they're enabling a, a confidential VM that has, you know, let's say in two years, has one of these new features and we don't actually have that code in the guest firmware, the guest kernel. That's really what I wanna discuss is how to fix that. So if we do nothing and if we screw up, let's like look at like live migration. Well, if, if somehow we, we figure out a way to organize these features in a way that's not super confusing and they create like their, their sev VM or their TDX VM, and somehow like in their configuration, they think that their VM is live migratable. Well, depending on how frequently live migrate, things may be working great and so on. And then like three, four or five days or three weeks or whatever that, that uh, frequency of live migration is, things just break unexpectedly. That's not good. Uh, and then you talk about like lazy accept. This is uh, la later in the uh, slides, I have some links to some upstream discussion we had about this. But okay, my understanding of the lazy accept patches is that the firmware tries to accept a minimal, guest firmware tries to accept a minimal amount of uh, memory into the guest. So let's call that like four gigabytes just for purposes of example. So then when you get into the kernel, the kernel is supposed to say, oh, here's my uh, uh, E820 table that has like, and they've added this new unaccepted memory type. And so guest kernel will be like, it's supposed to know about that and know how to like handle that. Well, if it doesn't even know about that, and if we have a guest firmware, that boots into a guest kernel that doesn't know about it. Well, if customer is like running fine with just those four gigabytes, but maybe they purchased a 700 gigabyte VM, they might be very angry when like in two weeks, like, you know, they, they, they oom and their VM dies. Um, and then I have uh, like, like hardware measured boot seems like maybe, a, I haven't thought through that as deeply, but that seems like a better case where it should, it would probably, uh, hopefully they're checking their measurements that it needs or both, it, then rather than running for a while, like I like in the first two scenarios, dying quickly is better, I would argue. If you want to add to that, please uh, feel free to speak up, but I'll keep going. So the rest of this, um, the rest of this slide is just, is just trying to build off of the discussion we had in the mailing list. Uh, actually a lot, and uh, going to some of those ideas in more detail. Um, so at a high level, these are the, the different ideas I'm gonna uh, discuss. So obviously if we could get all the features in from like day zero, that seems like the best. I know that's kind of the direction we're heading in the lazy except patch series right now. Um, I'm not sure that even if we get to work there, there's an open question. Uh, will we just be running into this problem later on? Uh, then I have a, this, this second bullet I was just thinking of yesterday. So maybe it doesn't work, we'll discuss it. But uh, uh, wasn't discussed on the mailing list, but could the guest somehow qu query itself uh, uh, to see if it has these features? Then there's feature negotiation that was discussed at length on the mailing list that, you know, be complicated. So, but but we'll talk about it. And then the other idea is like uh, at the uh, uh, image level, can we somehow like this is really pushing the burden up into the uh, for for like uh, us, like the cloud provider, whoever is uh, uh, managing creating these VMs. But can we somehow annotate the image itself with metadata to 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 uh, properly control this problem? So the, the get a feature working from day zero is, I just put it in here for completeness, but uh, I think rather than spend time on this slide, since this lasts only 20 minutes, um, I'll wait a minute to see if anyone wants to raise their hand. I think I'm just gonna jump to the next slide. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, here the idea is um, if, like once you're inside the VM, if it has some sort of pair interface or something to, say 
are these features enabled? Is lazy accept enabled? Enabled is um, is uh, lazy or uh, is live migration enabled or whatever? Like the bird, like could the guest check? Oh, this is what I think is enabled, and do I have the code to enable it? And so uh, this is just pseudocode. This is not like fully fleshed out, but that the assumption behind this is that in order to add a new feature, you basically have to have this this get firmware features map. Uh, um, without that, you cannot enable a, uh, a new feature. Otherwise, you run this chicken and egg problem where uh, uh, the, the guest code doesn't, you know, uh, if it just starts enabling it without doing any checks, you just, there's no way to know whether, whether it's, it, it, uh, what the situation is. Um, so the idea here is, you know, the guest firmware can say, okay, this is how I think I'm configured. Again, this is assuming some sort of pair virtualization uh, way for it to get that information for what the control plane. So like I created a VM and I clicked like somewhere, like give me this, this CVM 2.0, for example, that has live migration and SNP and lazy accept or whatever. And so this thing returns me like, like L live migration equals true, uh, lazy accept equals true or whatever. And then the firmware itself somehow has some data structure that maybe can be all zero, like a, like a bitmap map or sense all zeroed out to start out with, meaning all these features not enabled. So you can get a new feature. You reserve like some offset into the bitmap for that feature. I'm just making this up. And then it can say, oh, okay, my VM config had bit 12. Bit 12 is in the bitmap is live migration. Oh, but bit 12, like this thing doesn't exist. But if we checked it in, we defaulted all to zero. Now I check bit 12. And if bit 12 is like not equal to bit 12 my VM, config, then I'm just going to self-terminate myself and die early. So then we know that there's some work in the control plane. And then you can do the same idea in the guest kernel. So it's just basically a copy paste of this. So I'll take a pause. Uh, Becky? Or, or hold on, I think there should be a mic that we can toss you. Oh, is it? I'm trying not to kill somebody here. So what about future compatibility, for example? You run a guest kernel, you basically you're stuck in time. Now you add a new feature in the in the future, the guest doesn't know how to check if this feature is enabled or not because Yeah, so that's the whole idea. Like feature. this slide sort of on its own doesn't stand up very well. But like if we let's say we we add some like let's go let's just take a bitmap as a concrete game. I'm not saying that's necessarily the right way to do this. And let's say the bitmap, like let's say someone were to check in right now a, pa a patch into the, both the guest firmware and the guest kernel that just had like 1,000 bits and they're just all zeroed and they're all reserved. And then going forward, if you add into the firmware, say a new feature, say lazy accept, part of the patch set is to reserve one of those bits. And so if the guest can say, oh, I, and also part of the, the, the requirement is the guest has to have some way to, to query the host, maybe through some extension to GHCB or I don't know, or GCI or whatever, or GC, GCI is not the right thing, whatever the equivalent is on TDX, then if you sort of have like all these requirements, obviously if people screw this up, then things aren't gonna, this isn't gonna work. But if we put this as a new requirement to add a new feature, then the idea is that things default to not enabled. And when you add the new feature, you, you reserve some, 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 some data, uh, some bit or something in the guest to, to communicate that you're enabling the feature and make sure it's lined up with your VM configuration, if that makes sense. A bit like Vertio official negotiation, kind of. I will take your word for that because I don't know anything about Vertio. Um, so, uh, the, the, the Vertio feature comparison is pretty good. Do you actually need this at all? Like, I, and I guess just for the discussion, right? As a cloud provider, why can't you say, well, for lazy except, I need OVMF version blah and kernel version blah, and you just track all that? Because then also, if there's a bug found, the firmware version might say, Oh, I support lazy except, but actually it doesn't because I have that in a future slide. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what about just supporting the latest? Supporting like the problem we run into is like let's say let's say we go to like uh, let's say we all like we we have Sev out there today, so let's say we're going to enable like live migration. The problem is we run into this problem where like we have all the images out there that don't have the patches for like live migration. So we can't go to customers that are out and running and tell them they have to reboot, they have to like delete their VM and take the new image and all that. So that's why just supporting the latest is not really feasible. Uh, yeah. So so customers who are already running, they're not gonna get live migration. Right. 
when they reboot, they're going to get it. Or but then they have to switch it. their image. And my understanding is like, we can't force a customer to update their image. Oh, you've promised too much again. Yeah, we promised too much. Exactly. <laughs> now, I didn't make up that rule, by the way. That's, yeah. But. Okay, so I'll, um, let's say more. I guess I'll go to the next one. Okay, so this was discussed on the mailing list. Actually, a lot of this was discussed on the mailing list. Um, in fact, if it's a long discussion. I really liked uh, one of the uh, replies uh, Dave Hansen had where he's like, there's basically three things you could do, one, two, or three. So if people are just interested in, in this first link, I think that's a good read, uh, that particular reply. Um, but anyway, the idea uh, here, this, this was really discussed in the context of the lazy accept problem that I, I, uh, I described earlier. Maybe I should have or, or ordered this slide first just to give that background. But uh, the idea here is, is, the idea is really specific to lazy accept. I don't know how much broadly it applies, although maybe you have more ideas. But the idea here is like in that lazy accept problem where like the guest firmware itself has to, um, has to basically make a decision whether or not to go ahead and accept all memory into the guest or whether to just accept that minimal amount because it's assuming that the kernel it's going to boot into is enlightened about unaccepted memory is going to handle that. How, it, it, by the way, the kernel could just be enlightened enough just to accept it all up front if we wanted to, but it has, that, that enlightenment has, it has to know how to handle it or else you, the memory is not going to be available. And so the, let's see, I, uh, the pseudocode I wrote here, uh, so somehow the, basically this line right here, if kernel, somehow the guest firmware has to be able to infer what, uh, sorry, the guest, yeah, guest firmware has to be able to infer what guest kernel features it, it's booting into has. So I, I think this was discussed at length at the, um, on the mailing list, and I think the direction we were heading toward was, was this is probably not the right direction, but I, I wanted to put up here for completeness. I am a vector it. So this is from Dave Gilbert. Um, he makes the observation that the, uh, the handoff between the firmware and the kernel uh, doing the same migration so it can get confusing. And B, uh, the vertio is something like, here's the feature the host supports, the guest masks them, and you tell the hosts what the guest supports. Should we keep going and we can come back to Dave if... Uh... Okay, uh, go ahead for us. Can you, can you communicate to, to, to your customers, say, okay, you're getting this guest solution. Run your workload and everything you want to do with it and see whether... Right, that's something I don't have in the slide, but it's an excellent idea. And it's not even that we have to tell our customer to test it. We have quite a bit of testing in place that we, so actually one background, and maybe this is specific to Google Cloud. I don't know how this applies to other companies, mm -hmm. but we kind of have two categories of images, actually. We have the images that are sort of our well-supported, like we talked to, you know, SUSE, Canonical, mm. Red Hat, sorry if I left out your dish, but we talked to all of them and we know that like, they're, they're telling us, Google, this thing should work. And then we have quite a bit of testing we do. And I, I think that actually can help us quite a bit here and make this not nearly as bad as the talks coming off. So that 
is something, yeah. We don't even have to ask the customer to do it. We can get that, like before we enable the feature, we can test all those mainline uh, images and we should. Uh, there's also custom images where customers build their own image. I don't know how prevalent that is for confidential VM, I, but I, it is a thing. And for that case, I think exactly what you just suggested, Boris, maybe in our documentation, having, mm. you know, if you build your image, please run these. If we could make those tests open source, actually, because a lot of our testing is internal, um, that would help here. Because this whole thing we're talking about, this is temporary. Once all the features are right. there, you don't need well, it. That was one thing about the, the mailing list discussion that temporary can be like a long time. It, like there was a slide in here uh, from my um, co-author Gao that he put in, I removed it. But some of the distro kernels can be oh. old and they can take quite a while to be updated. Um, and like I was saying earlier, even if we have those good communication paths, which I feel like we do have, thank you to the folks who are with the audience or attending, uh, like I feel pretty confident I can reach out to distros and get the patches that we need in. But at the same time, I can't, I, because we're too nice to our customers, I can't go and tell everyone who used that old image to, I can't force them to switch easily. Okay, I think the time is up. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so the slides will get them posted to the website and then uh, folks can read off offline if they, uh, the rest of the talk just was talking about uh, image annotation as well. I think, and the version idea that David Kaplan had in there, there's a slide on that. Thank you. Thanks for the interesting discussion and thanks for your presentation, Mark. Um, <laughs> next is uh, Michael Roth who will talk about unmet private memory for confidential guests. I get my slides. Oh, what's the right one? This one's over here. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Ross. I'm from AMD, and I'm here to talk about unmapped private memory. Uh, So unmapped private memory, or UPM for short, uh, refers to some proposed uh, kernel infrastructure to back confidential guests with pages that can't be accessed from user space. And uh, the initial implementation of that uh, unmapped private memory is uh, uh, Chao Ping's uh, private mem slot patch set uh, listed there. Uh, so when I reference UPM, I'm basically referring to the uh, changes introduced by that patch set. Um, now, UPM has been proposed by a number of developers for various reasons, but uh, as I understand things, the, uh, the main driver of UPM is uh, Intel TDX, where um, if user space tries to write to a private guest page, you'll get a machine check. So obviously it's very important to have uh, some sort of infrastructure like this in place for that use case, but uh, UPM is also being evaluated for uh, other uh, use cases in wells, such as uh, SEV, SMP, uh, PKVM, I think also has a prototype and, and possibly others are, are looking at it as well. Um, now I'm from AMD, so obviously, you know, SMP is sort of my main focus for, uh, you know, where we could utilize uh, UPM. Uh, so some of the descriptions and topics here might be a bit SMP uh, centric, but I'm hoping that this is generally useful for some of these other use cases as well. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so with UPM, uh, you have a new private mem slot uh, structure in KVM. Uh, and before we get into that, just, uh, just a quick recap of how things look with uh, a normal uh, KVM mem slot uh, in the context of, of SMP in this case. So. Uh, here in the, the diagram on the right here, you have uh, guest A. Uh, in its page table, it has uh, a, a couple uh, uh, GPAs mapped in its page table. There's 2000H, which is uh, mapped as a shared page, and 3000H, which is mapped as a private page. Um, now, when there's a, a nested page fault and the KVM MMU needs to figure out uh, what's, um, what 
host page to use to uh, program into the nested page table to satisfy the nested page fault. In both of those cases, it's going to uh, do the lookup the same way. It's gonna uh, use the GPA to index into the mem slot. And then from that mem slot, it can get the host virtual address. And then from the VMM's process, the VMM processes uh, page table, it can then uh, figure out what HPA, uh, what, what host physical address uh, that HPA maps to. And then that's what it programs into the nested page table. So here's how things look like with the private mem slot uh, implementation. Here uh, you see for the, the shared page uh, 2000H, the lookup is handled the exact same way. But in the case of the private page 3000H, uh, there's this, uh, there's this when, 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 KVM, when the KVM MMU is doing, when handling the, uh, the nested page fault, it'll see in this, this X array that the uh, GPA 3000H um, is backed by uh, private memory. So in that case, instead of doing the normal lookup, it'll look, uh, it'll use the GPA to figure out uh, the, what index in this new memory, this, this special memory FD uh, backend to use to get to the uh, uh, host physical address that should be programmed into the, the nested page table. And that's sort of how things look when the guest, when the guest expects a private page and the uh, and KVM already has that recorded and mapped as a private page uh, using the memfd, but you also have to deal with things like uh, shared to, to private conversions and, and private to shared conversions. So uh, in this case, we have an implicit conversion where, um, where the guest tries to access the uh, page by, where the guest tries to, to, to flip the page to private by flipping it C bit. And, and so in this case, the, uh, the X-ray originally had that page mapped to a, a shared page, um, but now the guest is trying to access it as a, a private page. So in that case, you get a nested page fault, and the KBM MMU will see that the, uh, that the page is not backed by a private page like the guest is expecting. So in that case, with UPM, there's now this new KBM exit memory fault, which will exit out to user space and the VMM will then uh, figure out the uh, corresponding index in the uh, memfd and uh, make sure that a page is allocated there. And then it'll issue a KVM ioctal back to KVM to tell it to update the state of that page in the, um, in the X array. And then at that point, when you resume the guest, it should be able to, uh, the KVM MMU should be able to handle the, uh, the, the nested page fault without exiting back to user space. And uh, we also have a, for SMP, we also have uh, explicit conversions where the guest will tell uh, KVM in advance via a, a hypercall that, the, um, that it intends to use a particular page as a private page or a shared page. So in this case, it's telling uh, the, the hypervisor that 3000H should be a, a private page. And currently with uh, the SMP hypervisor patches, um, that's all handled in the kernel. But with UPM, we forward that, uh, that page state change out to the uh, VMM in the form of a, 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 KV, a new KVM exit, VMG exit. And then uh, the VMM will then do the same thing it does in the, in the implicit conversion case. It'll make sure that the memory is allocated in the memfd backend and then issue a KVM ioctal to uh, uh, flip the state of that page in the, the X-ray here. And then at that point, we can satisfy the, uh, the, the nested page fault. Uh, so there's a, a number of, of, of pros and cons with uh, UPM that I've, I've listed here. But on, on, the, on the pro side, uh, I guess sort of the, the, the main promise of UPM is that it provides uh, potentially shared infrastructure uh, for, for managing private pages, both for SMP and for TDX, because currently with SMP, we sort of have our own sort of SEV specific 
mechanisms for handling uh, private pages, uh, and we have certain requirements around there, like uh, we need to make sure that the pages are pinned, uh, and things of that nature, and then TDX might have its own requirements as well. So with UPM, we could potentially have all that handled with common infrastructure and, and, and all the, the good things that, that come out of that. Um, but um, in trying to utilize UPM for, for SMP support, uh, you know, th there are certain things that are still sort of SMP specific, platform specific, and in some cases there's no way around that. Um, like we need to update the RMP table in the case of SMP to uh, note that the, the the page should be treated as 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 shared or private. But there's some other things where it's 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 sort of up in the air whether uh, UPM uh, should handle that functionality um, because uh, in, in some cases there's similar requirements uh, between SMP and, and and TDX, and that sort of brings us to. Uh, our, our first discussion topic, which is um, sort of along that line, is um, another sort of requirement we have with SMP is, uh, you know, normally the uh, a thread in the host can't write to a guest private page, which makes sense because there's never um, a good reason for the host to be writing to a private page because it's it's you know, oh. Back to the previous slide, Michael. Sure. Uh, under the cons, you had one listed that uh, I want to bring attention to. Uh, it was the uh, potential to allocate double the memory. Mm -hmm. So I know, like at least in our setup, when we run a VM, we actually run it inside of a container, and the container is configured with a memory limit. Like let's say you have like a a, a 16 gigabyte VM. So you put 16 gigabytes in there plus a little bit of extra, you know, maybe another gigabyte. So I'm just making up some fudge here. So that for the so you have some memory for like the the user space hypervisor and whatever else you need, and so the reason we do that is because the whole point of cloud is to have efficiency and you know user infrastructure well. So if we're if we're allocating up to two x the memory because it's both in the private FD and the shared FD, then that's sort of a non-starter. So that's one thing I just um, this patch set's really awesome, but that's one thing that's been a concern of mine with it. Yeah, and there's there's also a flip side to that too where you can avoid the 2x memory usage by every time there's a page state change, you deallocate the page from, say, the shared uh, allocation, and then when you, you reallocate it in the, the, pri the private backends, um, you know, you, you make sure that you deallocate it so, so you don't have that sort of um, you know, double the usage. But if you do that every time, sometimes you have use cases where like I think currently in OVMF, uh, to handle bounce buffers, it'll flip the page to shared, do the DMA, and then flip it back to private, and it'll do that like a thousand times. And if you're allocating and deallocating every time that happens, then I, I think in our case, it was like a, a 3x slowdown for a fairly small guest, and then it's probably more significant the, the larger you go. So so that, that sort of raises the question of, you know, do you need some sort of kind of garbage collection sort of implementation in the VMM. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of complications around that. But, um, but at, at least on the kernel side, there's, there's a lot of good stuff to uh, UPM. And, and you, know, the, you know, the main thing being the shared infrastructure. But uh, in order to get the most out of that, there's, there's a couple uh, other cases that are possibly worth considering using UPM for. And one of them is uh, how we handle the kernel direct map. Um, so, uh, you know, we, you know, as I mentioned, you, you can't, there's, there's no good reason for uh, a thread in the host to write to a private guest page. But in some cases, uh, because the thread in the host might use a huge mapping, it might not be trying to write to a guest page, it might be trying to write to some other page. Um, or, or you know, it might be trying to write to a shared guest page, which is perfectly fine. But because that that overlap overlaps with a private page, then um, uh, you can have issues in some cases. In, in user space, if that happens, that's fine because you can just tell user space to you can just split the page in the user space mapping, and everything's fine. But in the kernel, we also have the direct map, and 
the kernel direct map is, is uh, it uses two megabyte mappings by default. So uh, there's a, so, so you know, it, when, when you have that same situation in, in the kernel, you, you can't just dynamically split the page when, when you get a, a page fault, you have to sort of figure out how to deal with it in advance. And there's a few different approaches for how to deal with that. We've sort of flip flop between a, a couple of these, but I think uh, the approach that we plan to take here is to, um, you know, anytime you uh, switch a page to private, you will then split the corresponding entry in the direct map. And the downside to that currently is that there's, there's no interface currently to restore the direct map as a two megabyte entry later, but I think that's, that's a solvable problem. So this is a, a fairly elegant solution. Um, but as I understand it, there's, there's also a similar requirement on the TDX side, which sort of raises the question of whether UPM should also handle uh, dealing with the um, uh, direct map as well. So I, you know, I don't know if there's any input from, from the audience on, on that, but that's just sort of something I wanted to raise that uh, you know, maybe we could follow up on the mailing list. So a little short on time, and this might take up a good amount. So I'm going to skip to the third uh, discussion topic I have here. And, and that's, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier when we have a uh, explicit page state change request, um, we forward that request out to user space. And those page state change requests are, uh, in the case of SMP, uh, they can do batching where you can tell the hypervisor that, you want to flip you know, 200 or so pages from private to shared. And that all happens at once. Um, and you know, to, to sort of maintain that batching, currently we uh, introduced this new KVM exit, VMG exit, so that that could be handled in user space. Um, but you know, that sort of differs from what's been introduced in the UPM patch set, which is this KVM exit memory fault. So I guess one question is, could we potentially, instead of forwarding that GHCB request out to user space and having this SMP specific handling that user space needs to deal with, can we reuse the KVM exit memory fault, but then also add, you know, sort of SG list support to it so that it could also uh, retain this, this, this batching support so that you could handle it the same way between SMP and TDX. So that's, that's, that's you know, another uh, possible thing to consider extending UPM support for that um, potentially follow up on. And uh, another one uh, I'll touch on quickly, I, I don't think we have too much time to discuss, but another one is um, a, a host kernel thread might be trying to access shared memory for a variety of things like uh, the KVM clock, VertIO buffers, GHCB pages. Um, but in some cases, uh, you might have a malicious guest that tries to flip those pages to private while the host is using them. And the question is, you know, how do you deal with that without uh, allowing a guest to, to crash the host. And the, uh, the approach we plan to take for SMP is to um, you know, basically introduce some handling in the host page fault handler so that whenever the host uh, is accessing a page that it thinks is supposed to be shared and somehow that page has got flipped to private, then we just automatically flip it back to shared. And if the host did that in error, then um, uh, the guest will know about it because when we do that, uh, we'll unset the validated bit. So the guest will notice it and we don't silently corrupt memory. Mark? Yeah, I, this, I feel this idea that like Peter in front of me actually had brought to the mailing list like before the whole UPM got kicked off in the context to be applied generically like you presented so well for Intel and uh, uh, AMD. And it felt like the one of the maintainers, uh, Andy Ludo was very negative on it editing fault.c to do that, that automatic conversion. Um, that, so I'm wondering, yeah, we could obviously try that again. And I, I recall he said something like, uh, he needs to see any code and, and maybe that can be dealt with. I know there were some pretty nasty race conditions that could fail in fault.c. 
So alternatively, I don't know if we can, uh, in the RMP update helper, maybe like have some data structure that marks these pages that are locked as shared and block the, the conversion in that case or take that sort of approach. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, the issue there is, um, you know, what if you do something like KVM vCPU map? Um, you know, currently that basically just does a, a K map on the page and there's really no mechanism in place currently to sort of invalidate that mapping if it keeps trying to use it. So I think you'd end up needing to introduce a lot of infrastructure to support that. And if that ends up being the case, then maybe that's a problem that UPM needs to solve because I, I doubt they would want that for something SMP specific or at least some sort of common infrastructure. Yeah, is this another way for the guests to use up more? Like you mentioned that with UPM, we can use double the memory for the same GPA space. If we're writing, you know, it could the kernel could be acting correctly in writing where the guest is telling it to, but causing extra memory allocation because of UPM. How, th this seems tricky to deal with, you know, how do we not, ex, you know, add extra GPA space just because the kernel's, the host is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, is that correct? Am I, am I thinking about that? Um, well, I, I think in, in the case of the host, I don't think it would necessarily cause an additional allocation. I, I, I guess may, maybe because it's holding on to the, the page reference. Well, it has to make the new, if, it, if you're writing to a private page and as shared, you're now adding back the, you're, you're now adding back the memory in the shared uh, mem slot, right? So you are growing memory. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the case of a kernel thread, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what happens in that, in that situation. That would be but user space, yeah, definitely. It could accidentally cause an allocation if it continues writing uh, to memory that's now private. Yeah. All right. And, and, and I think that's probably it for time, right? Okay, I think uh, time is up. Um, thanks, Michael, for the presentation. Next one is Steph Murek from IBM talking about security pooling confidential VMs with encrypted disk. Good morning. Um, okay, so this is uh, work I did with Tobin who's on the other side of town um, and a few others, of course, on the help of the community. Um, so, as everything here uh, today, we're talking about confidential VMs and we're interested in the case where we don't uh, trust the host and want to discuss a few approaches for encrypting the uh, guest uh, disk and I have no solutions today. So uh, start the community uh, discussions. I also want to refer to yesterday's talk uh, in the secure boot mi micro conference from GON, uh, Yao and Ken Liu from uh, Intel who also did a talk about confidential um, encrypted disk. So uh, some of these uh, overlap. So the approaches I think uh, we should, um, how, how should we uh, evaluate the approaches is of course, we want confidentiality and integrity. And ideally if we can make an approach that uh, works not just with one architecture, but with several or all, ideally, and something that would be easy to use for customers, for example, whether they can build and test the image locally without the, let's say, SMP or TDX, and then uh, send it to the cloud and run it uh, securely there. So what's currently available, for example, in uh, QMU is something called encrypted QCOW, um, which is a local disk. It also can be remote and the VMM performs the decryption and you give the VMM the passphrase. So indeed on disk, it is stored um, encrypted, but the host, the VMM has the decryption key and sees all the plain threat plain text um, sectors running uh, to and from the guest. So we consider this uh, uh, not secure because the key is here in the untrusted uh, area. 
Uh, so first approach uh, for confidential is, uh, was uh, built by uh, James here. Um, basically, it, in, it says, let's do the decryption inside the guest in uh, Grub, but we want Grub to be part of the measurement. and TDX, where you need currently the way to get the attestation report is later uh, in user space. Uh, the grub patches to add this module are not upstream, and the combined packaging of this OVMF, which includes grub in it as a one unit, uh, we had some trouble uh, getting it accepted to the various parties that need to do that, yes. Just an update. I am Grab Maintainer. I'm going to take these patches for next release, which will happen probably at the time of, of, of this year. I will be working with uh, James on, on, on these patches. Okay, good. So it might be upstream as opposed to what's written here. Thank you. So second uh, thing we looked at is uh, basically doing it later during boot in, uh, in HRD. So um, VM starts booting, uh, loads uh, OVMF, loads um, kernel, loads initRD, and then during initRD, there's a crypt setup um, lux uh, open, and that will do the decryption, and now we need to get the passphrase there. So what we do is, in, just before crypt setup, we uh, get the attestation report, uh, if you need a nonce, uh, so first ask for the nonce, we get the attestation report, and then we send it to the guest owner and receive the passphrase and then do the unlocking. Um, but what we need to have here is we need to measure everything up to that point. So we need to somehow make sure that the kernel and the initRD contain no malicious code that can steal the, the passphrase, for example. Um, so uh, the way we did it but for SCV and uh, SCVS, we have uh, patches. We it's already upstream in QMU and OVMF um, to include the hashes of um, kernel, kernel command line, and initRD inside the guest. So the hashes are included in the initial measurement, and they're passed in uh, from QMU and. Basically, OVMF verifies that what it's going to load uh, with direct boot is what indeed was measured. Um, so that makes it secure for that point. And we also have these uh, RFC patches for uh, <laughs> similarly for SNP. For TDX, you basically uh, can use the same approach, but you need to verify that the measurement differently. If uh, um, the full TDX support basically says there are these runtime uh, registers like TPM PCRs, which can measure, extend the measurement for kernel, for initRD, and so on. You need all the pieces in place in OVMF, in Grub, uh, in the kernel. And once you have this, 
uh, you can verify the measurement as well up to the point of uh, unlocking. Um, we see that each um, enclave has their own way of getting the attestation report. So there is one IOCTO in TDX and another one in SNP. Um, so that init script need to have all these ifs in it. Maybe this can be abstracted away by something like Clevis. I have no experience with it, but I was uh, told that it can do it, uh, or it can be added uh, elegantly there. Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense to unify that, let's say in the kernel to have slash dev attestation or something. I'm not sure because the actual blobs are pretty different between the architectures. Uh, okay, so we, this is working basically. We have tried it. Uh, I just say a caveat that on TDX we it's working, but we didn't uh, have all the correct measurement checking in place, but for the other, uh, but basically the machinery is working on all of them. And downside here is um, kernel and initRD are not encrypted. Um, they're basically the host past them. Uh, it's okay, for example, we are using this uh, scheme in confidential computing where this uh, kernel on initRD basically contains the runtime how to run, sorry, confidential containers which uh, these init ID contains the runtime of how to start a new container. That's open source, that's public. We have no need to encrypt that. We just need to measure that. Um, but uh, if you have cases where the guest can run, I don't know, ups, update kernel or something uh, and uh, get in, and replace the kernel and then the measurement changes, how, how does that uh, play along? Um, so measurement, of course, needs to, it don't, not only includes just the OVMF, it has to include all the parts, it makes it harder to verify, maybe Peter has a magic solution in the next talk. Um, and hardening is more difficult because there's more um, area which can access the secret and, and do something wrong. Um, this is actually true for the entire life cycle of the guest. So if something in the guest later, even after decryption, something allows the host to, I don't know, connect a device that causes a problem and then exposes something, then it's not confidential. So okay, now uh, approaches that look like um, TPM. So in physical TPM, uh, physical machines which have TPM can do full disk encryption or unlocking uh, either script setup uh, and there um, I see patches to do this uh, as well in uh, Grub, earlier in Grub. Um, so can we use something similar in confidential VMs um, to do the unlocking? Um, Again, like full disk encryption that we talked about earlier, um, everything is measured and the kernel in ETRD are encrypted as well, so that's nice. But this VTPM is currently in the air. For SNP, we know that they have um, this mechanism called VMPL, which allows you basically to run part of the guest as a higher privilege from the rest of the guests. So we can have VTPM running in VMPL zero, which has the higher uh, privilege, and the rest of the kernel and the OS in uh, VMPL one. And that makes sure that both the VTPM is not accessible both from the host because it's inside the enclave and also not from the guest OS. So the guest OS kernel, let's say, cannot modify the PCR values or stored inside this VTPM. Um, but outside of SNP, can, can we, do we have an idea how to do this? Um, I don't. Um, well, in TDX, there are ideas of something like another TDVM that somehow has a higher privileges and can look into that, uh, the main customer VM um, but I'm low on details on that. And 
Now the question with VDPM is, um, so in hardware uh, TPM you have storage, you have a small NVRAM that is persistent. How do you do that? And it's secure, so you cannot, uh, the host cannot read it. Um, how do you do that in cloud? Uh, how do you have something which is uh, persistent and encrypted and, I mean, protected from the host and uh, available to the to the guest at runtime? That's a question. Uh, one other idea that uh, James once uh, raised is if we go back to the first first uh, slide, which mentioned uh, encrypted QCOW images. Uh, the problem there was that uh, decryption was done in the VMM, which is outside, which is untrusted outside the envelope. Can we have the same thing through the decryption somehow inside the guest, but in a level where the rest of the guest sees a plain text disk as li like um, the encrypted QCAL that we have today in, in QMU? Um, so somehow move the decryption code from QMU to inside the guest. But uh, where exactly inside the guest um, this code can be, I don't know, when disk drivers, something like that. And how can this uh, decryption layer receive the disk passphrase or uh, decryption keys? Again, it's an open question. It has to be very, very early in the guest because the moment, I don't know, OVMF or Mac will want to read the first sector of the disk, uh, this will need to go into play and decrypt. Um, so it's more questions, as I promised, than answers. Um, yes, and that's it. And if anyone has any other ideas or uh, ways we should pursue or should not pursue, I'll be happy to. Yeah, so um, from the solutions you showed, I think for standard virtual machines, not for containers, but for virtual machines, full-blown virtual machines, uh, to me it looks like it goes into the direction of having a virtual TPM somewhere in the system, either in, with SNP in, a, in a, a lower VMPL where it's secure or in a separate um, TEE, which you can do with TDX, but also with SCV and SCVES. So um, we've all, we already see uh, deployments using uh, such a setup, and I think others will adopt that. So for example, the, the uh, Microsoft Cloud, their confidential offering uses a TPM for disk unlocking and... Yes, so we, so I agree. Um, and that's what they do, for, that's at least what uh, they write they do on uh, with SNP. Um, we tried to think whether whether it's possible to have this with a secure TPM. So I w it is possible if some part of the TPM is run is executed on the host, then it's not and it's not secure, right? Yeah, the, the the TPM needs to be hidden from the host. Yeah, and on SNP you can do that with VMPLs and the SVSM you uh, had in your slides. Um, all others can use a separate um, secure VM, and all the hypervisor needs to do is provide a secure channel between the VM itself and the uh, and TPM. The, and the other, yeah. and the yeah. TPM. Communication yeah. needs to be encrypted and all, but yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is something we can uh, explore, maybe. Whoever was suggesting the use of a secure VM, the VTPM, how do you ensure that that VTPM is running on the same secure host as the host you're measuring? I'm not sure it has to be on the same host, but you want to make sure that um, it's your VTPM, I don't know, that, that you're running it and not uh, uh, someone else who can steal your secrets or... Um, yeah, the, if the TPN is running in a, in a separate um, secure environment, it also needs to be able to send an attestation report to the virtual machine to, so that the virtual machine can actually verify that it's 
the correct TPM and that, um, yeah, it's what is, what is expected to run there. Yes, Peter. So with the with the BTVM in a separate VM, unfortunately, you're using double the resources. So when we have limited, we have ACIDs and we have HKIDs, we then double that for every VM, and that that can be a big cost. Yeah, what you double is the ACIDs, but not the memory. And the TPM basically only uses one vCPU, and it. Yeah, it's it's more the ACIDs and, and on TDX the HKIDs that are that are concerned because those are those are much more limited than the memory. I think there's only. A couple hundred on on AMD and, and less on TPX. Yeah. So that's a, a downside for this approach of extra VM for for each BTPM. Okay. okay. If there are not, no more questions, then I think it's also time to move on to the next session. Thanks, Dov. Next, Peter will talk about uh, dice attestation. Yeah, maybe you see it. Uh, following in that line, uh, I'm Peter from Google Cloud. Uh, we're on the confidential computing team, and I'm going to talk about dice attestation for confidential VMs and maybe confidential containers and beyond. Does that work? Oh, good. Okay, so quick agenda, talk about what the talk is, what DICE is, how we can use DICE with confidential computing, and what needs to be done if we want to do so. Um, so what is this talk? You know, I'd like to start a discussion around measured boot and attestation. I think lots of people here want to do that, so glad we're sh similar goals. Uh, here's a possible solution. Don't know if it's the best one or one we should work on, but you know, would like to talk about this here and uh, meet folks here interested in talking about this now and, and into the future as we start to build out this stuff. Um, so my goal is that users of confidential computing or confidential VMs can use attestation to verify their workload's code identity. So uh, what, I be, what I mean by this is, I think a lot of us here are familiar with attestation, but uh, for those that aren't, so attestation would allow a customer, so if they're running some code on a cloud provider, and they would like to, you know, remotely, back on their on-prem, whatever, verify cryptographically that what they think is happening is, is actually happening. So that's 10,000 foot attestation. Um, code identity is that during that attestation flow, they would like to actually verify that, you know, I built this binary on my, my system, here's my container hash, here's my workload, and here's the hash that I got. When I run that on Google Cloud or whatever cloud, I wanna see that that hash I can cryptographically prove that I'm running the binary I want to. So, so they're not running a version with a name. They can actually link, you know, the cryptographic attestation with some proof that they're running the code that they expect to be running and want to be running. Um, so here's where DICE comes in. It's an acronym for Device Identifier Composition Engine. Um, so this is a specification from the Trusted Computing Group, uh, same group that does the TPM that we're talking about a lot here. Uh, its goal is to provide security and privacy foundations for systems without a TPM. So it sounds a lot like our confidential VM environments or confidential computer environments. I know we can build TPMs, but they don't explicitly have a real physical one. So this, this could be an interesting thing for us to use. Um, and uh, yeah, so the results of this are an identifier which represents the combination of hardware and software of a device's boot sequence. So again, this seems like it helps us meet my goal of you know, code identity. We, we can prove cryptographically that we're running that exact hash. Um, this is a relatively new standard, especially compared to TPM, but it, it's gaining a lot of traction. This is used on Android. You know, when you do Android does verify boot and you can actually, different Android processes can attest to each other using a dice chain, which we'll talk about more. I know Microsoft and other IoT vendors are also investing in this as they might not have TPMs in all their deployments. So DICE is a layered approach, and, and we kind of get this thing that some people call DICE chain. So the boot or your runtime is typically divided into layers. We're all kind of familiar with that, so not a huge change. Um, so you know, on a typical Linux boot, we have an OVMF. We 
then run Grub, we then run into Linux, and then you know we start our user space processes. So basically, at a high level, each version, e each layer in Dice measures the next layer, certifies that layer, and then kind of cleans out its private state and then goes to the next layer. So, so a couple of terminology which might come up, and if you read the specs over there, are the UDS or the unique device secret and the CDI, the compound device identifier. So, so the UDS makes a lot of sense when we're talking about IoT devices. They have physically different you know, identities. Um, this might make less sense in a cloud where you know, a server is running a couple thousand VMs or something. So might might not play into our use case so much, but but is interesting. And the compound device identifier is, I think, what we're more interested in is, is a way to compound the identities of each boot layer into a new identity, which is the representation of all those boot layers. Um, and we'll dig into that. So what is actually the job of a layer? So the inputs from the layer are the outputs of a layer because you just rinse, repeat the process for as many layers as you want to boot. So the inputs are the CDI of your layer and a device ID key pair. So this is your identity. This key pair is, if, if you're the boot layer, personifying the boot layer, then this key allows you to attest to what you are or you know certify new layers or certify what you'd like. Um, and also you have access to the code, configuration, some metadata about the next layer. And, and you output you output the CDI for that next layer and a um, certificate for that layer's device ID key. So here you can see a, a layer boots up, you have your CDI. Here you can you know, run that through KDF, you get your device ID uh, key pair. That has already been certified by the previous layer. So you can then you know, do what you need to do, set up memory, et cetera. Uh, you're ready to go to the next layer. You measure that layer. You add in some configuration. You make it, you know, that goes into the new CDI. So you've taken your CDI, mixed it through with the uh, info and, and measurement of that next layer. That is that next layer's CDI. And you can derive the key pair for that CDI and then use your device key to certify that CDI. Uh, then importantly, uh, if you don't have a secure place to store anything, which we, we probably don't in confidential community, in, in, in SMP or TDX, we might not have a secure place to store anything. So we can just zero out our CDI and zero out our device ID private key, not accessible to the next version. Uh, we package that all up for the next boot layer and, and we jump to it, you know, process repeats. This repeats on and on. And then what does our end state look like? So in our end state, the, the workload at the end has a device ID asymmetric key pair. Again, that is the identity of that workload. It has a, a certificate chain from zero to N layers of you know, its boot stack, which certify each layer up to itself the workload. So those layers, you know, zero to N, those are all certified, or um, you know, one to N, those are all certified by previous boot layers. Um, and then we get to the boot stage zero, which, which needs to be signed by the, the SOC, the device of some sort. So with SNP, this might be the ASP. With TDX, this could be uh, the, uh, you know, there's an SGX enclave there, which does the signature. And then typically that device will have another certificate chain back down, routing it to the vendor. So the device, the device ID gives the workload the ability to attest its identity you know, cryptographic identity to remote parties. So that seems like it, it meets the goal that I'm, I'm trying to work towards. We also do, as a little bonus, we do have a CDI still, and we can, we can run that through KDFs. And if we'd like, we could probably do sealing with that too. So, you know, th there's multiple use cases here. Um, so here is a simple Linux dice flow. Uh, you know, I think there's a good amount of trade-offs between secure boot, TPMs, and dice. And maybe in more ephemeral, stateless use cases, DICE might be more suited because of its simplicity versus a TPM. So, so here I've, I've illustrated a, a pretty simple, this is, this is very similar to, I think, the, the Kata containers that were presented yesterday at KVM forum. So you know, boot through OVMF, that's the boot layer zero. We can then go to a, you know, an EFI stub, an RAMFS with a, with a Docker or you know, some sort of container runner. That's our next boot layer. And then we can, actually, we can actually fork the boot layer. So 
easy example, you know, the second layer, you know, some Rust container a customer has written, some Go container they've written. You know, we have two, and we have two prime for this ELU. You, you know, you can fork because as layer one is measuring the Rust container, the Golang container, it's then just generating two different CDIs, one for each container, and sets it up for those containers to run. Before it runs either, it needs to clear out its state. Um, yeah. So here is, you know, very simple AMD uh, SMP specific version of what that certificate chain looks like. So I've abstracted all of AMD's VKEC certificate chain, um, but you can read about that online. So that certifies basically the uh, AMD secure processor. So that's our hardware uh, measure. So the OVMF, you have the first step in this boot, um, the ASP measures and, you know, signs the, the you know, the identity of that, the hash of the OVMF, and its device ID key with its, its key there. Um, and then we can measure that kernel and container image that we have a nice certificate there leading to the container certificate. And then our last block here is, you know, the container can then use its device identity to, you know, sign any user data that comes in. So you could build some arbitrary cryptographic protocol off this, you know, maybe MTLS or something interesting here. Um, so let's dig into this a bit. So when we're looking at, you know, how, how do we validate this is right? So, you know, we got a lot of layers to validate, but the, you know, the cert chain from the hardware vendor, that's all the same, no matter what we do. So we'll, we'll start at the first layer of the device chain. So uh, first we want to validate that our OVMF binary is acceptable. So in, in DICE, the, you know, one of the trade-offs we're making is, each layer is a certifying authority. So its certificates are only as good as that code is. So we want to check that, you know, is this OVMF one that we can trust? There's no CVEs pending, et cetera, et cetera. We built it maybe. Maybe someone's endorsed it. Some audit has happened. Check, check that that hash is good. And then, you know, we want to check that the signer is good. The signer in this case uh, is the uh, ASP. Check that that VKEC checks out. It's the latest one. It's the, it's the one that we want. Is that ASP trustworthy? If so, good. We then can trust this device, this OVMF's device ID to further certify statements. So uh, the next thing is, you know, we're trusting that device ID key. It has signed a certificate for that kernel, uh, that kernel's device ID key. Um, we can look at that, verify the signature, and then we can verify, like we did on that OVMF, that this, uh, you know, EFI stub, this init RAMFS, this all looks good to us, and, and we can continue the process up another step to towards the workload. Rinse, repeat until we get to the workload. Um, but how do we get kind of the the layer zero is unfortunately where we're going to have to do a little work on each vendor. So the layer zero can abstract the hardware vendor differences. So anything above layer zero luckily gets to run exactly the same. So it does help us minimize vendor specific code, which is a nice property. So as an example of our layer zero on SMP, we, we can use the, the get key uh, command for the guest to talk to the ASP for a CDI. So the, the, the get key command, while not written to be a CDI, actually meets the hardware specification by the TCG for a CDI. So, uh, you know, lucky for us, you know, we can, there's a lot of different options we can do to that CDI. We can bind it to the hardware itself, whereas that UDS concept makes sense. So, okay, I'm actually attesting to, I'm running on that physical server, et cetera. Um, or we can do it based on a, a VM root key. Uh, you know, there's a couple options there. But uh, yeah, so VM gets the, does the get key, gets its CDI zero. From CDI zero, you know, we can derive our uh, device ID key and then use the quoting feature from the ASP to generate a, you know, it, it's not an X509 certificate, but it is a certificate of some kind of that device ID key. So this is where the difference would be from a TDX or SCV. SCV might have to do this layer differently or, you know, one arm has a, a functionality. So this is where our differences are. You know, we get the quote. The quote gives us a signature over our uh, device ID key and has the measurement of the OVMF. So this is our first uh, DICE certificate. And then we can continue up the chain as we would for any um, any different hardware vendor boot. Um, so what do we have? What needs updating? So luckily for us, the Android folks have been working on this for a while. We already have the dev open dice driver. Um, this is kind of just a, 
a very simple driver. It, it allows us to get the, you know, the raw dice bytes from the previous layer to user space. So in the, in the example, that simple device flow, that would allow the init RAM FS, you know, some binary in there could use open, <clears throat> open uh, dice to pull out the, you know, its dice inputs from the previous layer, do its, uh, do its dice layer, and then go to the next workload. So, you know, there's no nothing in OVMF or Grub or, or anything else distro specific. So there would be a lot of lift here compared to, you know, adding a TPM, uh, but we, we do have a starting point. Um, so a quick recap, Dife gives us workload ID device key pairs. So, you know, a cryptographic identity based in each layer's, um, you know, in each layer's code. Uh, which is a pretty strong statement. Uh, Dice has, uh, you know, we have hardware identity. The device ID can perform remote attestation, and this involves no further, you know, one benefit here is we're, we're limiting our chatter to the ASP. We use that device ID key to be our identity for talking to remote identity, so we don't reach back into the SP, which is you know, a limited resource on the system, an another advantage. And also this can be used in place of a TPM, but there are, there are also some, you know, like the ceiling example, this can also complement a TPM. So I don't know if it's an either or, um, there are some advantages to both. So, you know, little diagram, we can route a confidential VM's device ID, MTLS to a customer certificate, which, which is a pretty interesting story. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming. Let's discuss on the list, get in touch directly. And, and there's the specification in the open dice code from, from Android. So any questions, I guess. Uh, I have a question. Uh, could you tell us shortly what kind of changes do you need uh, to do in the grab to support the uh, device? I, I, could you repeat that? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, could you uh, tell us shortly what kind of changes uh, you have to do in Grub to support that DICE? Sure. Um, so DICE is a very loose standard from TCG. Open DICE is a standard from the Android folks to give it a bit more specification. You know, it defines the Seaboard certs. So they do provide C code. So it might just involve linking in that C code to do the DICE layer. It does. It has all the you know the KDFs and the certificates and things like that. So it's you know getting the input from OVMF, running that C code, putting the output for the next layer somewhere. Okay, makes sense. Uh, how uh, the C code is licensed? The C code is licensed. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't actually know. I, I think it might be MIT, um, but yeah, okay. I can you. get back to you. Thanks a lot. Question on the approach. So is the main thing which you're hoping to kind of achieve with this DICE approach is the unification of attestation between vendors? Because I'm not familiar with I'm the approach currently like on attestation, but uh, I'm expecting that they also have it working, like and or at least working. And GDX is also able to kind of provide you all the goals that you have here. But of course, it's going to be GDX specific the way it's done. And I guess in MD case, it's going to be MD specific. So is this main goal is to just make it like uniform? But you don't have to, you basically, like, as you said, like you only do this one layer and then you're hoping to build all the things on top, which is vendor independent. So vendor, in the question was, is my main goal vendor independence? Uh, that's not the, the main goal is is a way for customers to get that, that code identity. Um, I think that we all can write pretty good attestation libraries that customers can audit and use. So, so. I think that the vendor independence can happen at a couple different places. I think that's one advantage. You know, one nice thing here is the only thing that is vendor specific is that layer zero, and then the the remote verifier needs to to have vendor specifics. I know that this won't work in TDX, or I believe it it won't. If someone knows how to make it work in TDX 1.0, I'd like to know. But I don't think we have ceiling capabilities in TDX, so it might not work for that. Um, for some Cloud VM kind of stuff, um, where is the benefit over using a virtual TPM? The equivalent, or is that like, why would I use this? Yeah, I think, you know, the TPM and DICE have very similar goals. The TPM is one way of giving you a cryptographic identity. This is a different way. Um, right. We don't currently have a TPM for SMP. I know that, that we're working on one. One advantage could be, you know, 
If you prefer having a much smaller uh, TEE, you don't want to link in an SVSM, this is a way for you to get this security without linking that in. You, you, you can have less layers, less code. And the, the, I think the SVSM could implement DICE if, if you'd like to use that for sealing, et cetera. So uh, I think it's a, it's a trade-off. All right, to, uh, building off of the last two questions, if we had VTPM or whatever TDX is doing today, which Elena just said we do, like, and if we could get the full measured boot out of those today, would we still want to do the DICE? Like you mentioned maybe less code or like, the trade-offs are not, and the summary of the trade-offs of the two are not obvious. So I'm just curious, if we had that all today, would you still be proposing this? And if so, why? Um, yeah, I, I think that we do have use cases where the less code is nice and not having to, you know, if you're in, in that simplified use case, you're not a typical distro boot. You're something new. You're a Kata container. You're some other, you know, smaller use case. So the TPM specification, how the PCRs are used, isn't relevant to you. So something simpler may be, may be, easy for you, may be easier for you. Um, you also do have the, the forking of the capability. I don't know if such a thing is possible with the TPM because everything is loaded into the same PCRs. Hi. Um, so we'll soon have like four different types of measurements that are taking place uh, in GRUB, in EFI stub, for uh, normal TPM, for TDX, for DICE maybe, there's the DRTM stuff uh, that's coming. Is there a way we could kind of abstract this in, the, in, in this particular case? Uh, do you think the DICE machinery could be exposed to the firmware, to the loader, uh, in the same way as the TCG protocols uh, currently expose the measuring interface? Um, I'm I'm not sure I fully under the question, understand the question, but can we abstract this into the current TCG code in Grub and EFI stub? So so basically, what the EFI stub well, uh, the EFI stub now does some of it, uh, but Grub already has this code uh, out of three, where it will measure stuff by grabbing the TCG protocol from EFI and use that as an abstract thing to measure. It doesn't know about the TPM. It doesn't know about what goes on under the hood. So it would be very useful if we could have an abstraction where you say, okay, this is something that is important enough that I need to measure it. If, if we could abstract that in a way that it's up to the firmware or whatever uh, underlies it to decide how to implement the interface without being aware at the caller level that, oh, this is a DICE measurement. Oh, this is a TPM measurement. Oh, this is a TDX measurement. Oh, this is a DRTM measurement. To have some kind of uniformity there so that we don't have an explosion of code uh, in those uh, boot layers. Yeah, I, I think that's good to be mindful of. I, I'm not familiar with the grub code, but if there is already an abstraction layer to hide all of the different attestation layers, I, I think this should probably play well into that, but I'm happy to chat offline at any other time. Okay, so thanks for the lively discussion. Um, Next session is Elena uh, talking about hardening Linux guests. Your slide somewhere. Yeah, I think it's this one. Hey, hello everyone. So I'm Elena and I would like to talk and actually I would like to really make this more like a discussion session uh, rather than me going through the slides. I have some slides here, but just merely to kick off the discussion. So um, I think everyone probably in this room understands what the threat model change which we have with the confidential cloud computing. So we used to trust the VMM in the house, now we don't trust it anymore here. But what does it actually mean for the software stack running inside these protected guests? So we have these confidential cloud solutions now from the AMD, from Intel, maybe some vendors are coming, which, which have a way to protect the guests. We have a way to protect the memory, the registers, and so on. But the guest, is, it, guest software stack doesn't live in a vacuum. It needs to communicate with the host. It needs to communicate with VMM for various reasons. And, and, and it usually does it through either the um, Parallel I.O. In, uh, interface or through the shared memory. And, and uh, it, it's like for parallel cases, it's like, you know, you can think that the guest still needs to do some MMIO reads, or reads, it will need to read the PCI config space and so on. 
and and of course the DMA is usually done I think for both MD and uh, Intel TDX it's uh, done for the uh, through the uh, shared memory regions so we, we can think now of this guest kernel and guess I'm gonna focus more on the kernel but uh, it's it's actually applicable to the whole stack you run including virtual firmware the bootloaders you have anything you have in the software stack of the guest so you can think of this now as as, as as we are running inside this protected environment, but we have to still communicate out and we have to consume this input, which are now malicious. A and this is not the attack surface we have envisioned before for the kernel. So we have for years, we have tried to secure the attack surface between the user space and a kernel, and we have created enormous amounts of mechanisms and, and ways and, and, and techniques for hardening that attack surface, including fuzzing, uh, many uh, extensions to compilers and so on. But now we have this new attack surface to think about. And, and, and as I said, that most of, for most of it, this attack surface is fully unhardened. So we have always used to trust what we get, the input we get from the drivers, the input we get from hardware, the input we get from reading the PCI config space. These kind of things have always been trusted in our view, but now it's not anymore. And uh, just to indicate like how widespread this problem is. So I have made like quick check back in time in 5.11 kernel. So we had a lot of places where we would, even if we just focus on Paravert IO, so all this MSR, port IO, MMIO and so on reads, we have a lot of location, code locations, which perform in the kernel, which perform these reads. I mean, they're not interested in writes because that just goes out into unprotected domain, but they're interested in the reads from the unprotected space because this is where we can consume the malicious input. So, um, and, and unsurprisingly, most of this code is actually in drivers. So we have a lot of drivers which do, you know, during the probe function and so on, they, they go read the PCI config space, they do set up their MMIO mappings and so on. So the, this talk is really, the goal of this talk is, is to kind of say that, okay, while everyone is currently in confidential computing, focusing in enabling the basic technology, so to make sure it's working, to make sure we have performance right, the attestation things are working, you know, disk is encrypted and protected. We also start to, we have to start thinking together how do we actually address this problem? Because if we don't have this problem addressed, any easy, any of these bugs in the, let's say, device driver read, and, and we have, when we went through kind of hardening of our own kernel, we have found these bugs, I mean, in, in reality. So any of this bug can pretty much take down all the whole security. So you can use this bug, you can obtain some primitive read, write primitive in the kernel, and you can take over this protected VM, which you have spent so much effort and time kind of, you know, protecting using the hardware means and so on. And, and, and there are a lot of aspects to kind of talk about, and, I, and definitely I'm not gonna have time to talk about them all, but I want to bring a couple of aspects which are probably the, are gonna be the hardest to kind of to merge to upstream and the hardest to agree on. And that's why it's important that people start, that we start discussing this together, people start to raise that they feel, if we feel that this is needed, but also for their use case, but you also start to raise this um, uh, on discussions. So, so as I said, the main problem, the main kind of share of this huge new attack surface lays in the drivers. And, and, and the good part of it, so if we would go and try to kind of, you know, harden all that attack surface, it's enormous effort. So we have even just inline kind of, mainline drivers, we have a lot of them. And, and, and it's not clear who's gonna be doing that work, but uh, likely, luckily they don't really need most of its drivers at all. So we, we, what we need is a way to reliably disable these drivers from being, so basically reliably disable that code from being run in protected guest. Because if the code is not run, we don't have to worry how it behaves if malicious input is injected. So, and, and for that, a uh, while back, we have been proposing uh, to mailing list the concept of a device filter. So it's a basically a runtime filter, which kicks in inside, if we're running inside a protected guest, it can be unified for kind of any type of protected guest. And it, it has a small allow list of the drivers, which, which are allowed to kind of actually execute. So, and, and these drivers will be authorized and be able to run probe and from this interaction with untrusted VMM and the host. Um, this approach has, has had, so I think Greg has raised a number of issues, how, how this kind of the just technical approach has to be changed. And on our side, Satya has been working to kind of address this technical feedback. 
there are a couple of still open, so I'm just mentioning here for completeness, but uh, things like which we still have to figure out how to do because like this allow list, even if we move it out of the kernel, the original patch is headed in the kernel, so we probably should, and we will move it out of the kernel into an ERD. Uh, because there's a way also that you can protect an ERD and we can have at least where so that the kernel kind of code is clean from that. But um, there are a couple of smaller issues with uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, approach where we need to kind of make sure that we are not hard coding, we are not only hard coding in PCI ID numbers because there are some cases like this in VME, it actually can be whole class which we need to address and so on. So we're, I I'm sure we're like, we're, changes and technical kind of details that we can figure out together. But uh, the main pushback, which kind of conceptually we had from the mailing list was, okay, so can we just go from, for example, like just using some minimal kernel config for confidential computing? And it would be, in our understanding, it was not a very good approach for vendors. So that vendors don't want to have the, or, you know, the minimal confidential cloud uh, computing kind of config, kernel config is hard to maintain. It's going to be specific to use case, but uh, I don't know what, what kind of are, uh, I would like to kind of pose here and ask what kind of opinions people have on this approach and do you see our alternatives here or anyone who wants to comment here? Um, so one of the things that we have in the cloud is we're not really sure that the threat model from the host into the guest is a real one that we need to worry about because if an external entity compromises our cloud and gets into the host, it's pretty much game over for the cloud. That's a business destroying event. So the only real threat model from the host to the guest is the cloud service provider. And most of the time, we really would like our customers to trust us that we're not actually trying to hack their virtual machines. So while we think the threat model for driver hardening is useful, it's largely theoretical from the attack vectors we're actually trying to protect our customers. We mostly want to know that A, we can protect external entities from getting into the cloud host, which isn't, the, isn't what this protects against, and uh, sort of B, it's sort of, they would like some assurance that we're not going to attack them, but they mostly take our word for it. You're basically saying you have no need, essentially, of this uh, hardware confidential cloud. I'm not saying no need. What I'm saying is I think we have a lot bigger fires to fight in confidential computing than hardening the, uh, uh, the device driver there and the guest. Well, like getting attestation to work, for starters getting an attestation that a customer can use easily. I mean, but this is way- But tangential. imagine you get this right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will get this in, in, in one or two years, all this attestation and, and things will be resolved. So what is the state after that? So I'm, I mean, like, can we really claim that this is a secure setup where we really took the, you know, the cloud providers out of TCB and you don't have to worry about like, you know, the, if, if you get like, you know, compromise or, something happens to your infrastructure, as you said, so you don't want to get this end goal of, of actually trying to be out of the TCB. Well, I, I, all security is useful, but the problem with all security is it comes at a cost both in terms of development and in terms of integration. And the, the I'm not actually saying this is bad, I'm just questioning is the cost benefit worth it for what we're doing in this particular area? Given that, I mean, most of the protection from somebody getting into the host is done at the cloud level, and we're all really, really careful to make sure this doesn't happen. So that, that compromise route is something that we really try and block. Um, but if you could help us with other devices for blocking that route, we'd be really happy, but that's not the device route into, into the guest. It's something coming out of the guest into our containment environment. I see the threat model as the fact that the guest doesn't trust their provider. So yep. the, the, like the external attacker is the cloud provider itself. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the whole, the whole point of cloud computing. Well, it's, it's a selling point that confidential computing tries to do, but it's not really a selling point that most cloud service providers use to their end customers. I mean, right at the moment, what we try and sell to our end customers is simplicity of cloud setup. 
And what we'd like to sell them eventually is verification that when we promised you we did X, Y, and Z in confidential computing, it actually happened at the time we said it happened. But most, most unsophisticated cloud customers do not want to be involved directly in things like the attestation chain, secrets release, and the like. We have a few sophisticated ones who do, but most don't really care. The threat model where we, the, the unsophisticated customers don't trust the cloud doesn't really exist. So I, I, yeah, I was gonna, assuming we eventually want to uh, do what Elena's proposing here and uh, lock down these drivers, which is where we are converting the private data to shared or other interfaces, other host uh, uh, guest interfaces, even if in the short term, there's a lot of, uh, uh, validity to what uh, James was saying. I think in the long term, with the fellow who was right to me, we, we definitely want to get to a model where like we can reduce the trust that the the customer has to have in the uh, the vendor. So going back to uh, a couple comments, uh, going back to your comment about the kernel config, seems like a question for the distros. Uh, but my limited experience is that that seems like a big ask for them to essentially have two images with like one just confident. I, I don't know that. This just seems like a question for the distros. So I just wanted to mention that. The other thing I'm gonna comment on that I, I know very little about, but maybe others do. I know uh, in Google Cloud, we have something called Container Optimized OS. I don't know a lot about how it works. I just know from playing with it, it doesn't let me install uh, random kernel modules. I don't know what the prior art there is because in Linux, the driver is essentially a kernel module. So I just wanted to mention that. So just a follow up comment to that. So I mean like, this trust avoid having multiple kernel config for each and every use case. But what we usually have is we build as much as we can as a module. Um, so, so all you would have to do is to find some way to remove these problematic drivers or have an allow list of drivers that you actually build into the, the image that you want to ship to the customer. That doesn't mean that you build a different kernel, you just restrict the number of modules you actually package so they're available in your confidential VM. Um, maybe that already tackles part of the, the issue. But does it actually allow you to really limit for all the drivers? I mean, I, I does mean, it, does you, it work you for low level like platform drivers and things like that? Can you really limit it through a config? I mean, whatever you can build as a module, we usually try building as a module so we can- If it builds as a module, but um, um, my question is, does, is every, is all the drivers- I, I, I'm not sure if they're all of them. I mean, you might need some initial thing, but usually we bootstrap from the inner drama test. So my best guess is that most of it should be a module. And all you'd have to do is then like go over the, the, the image and simply delete the drivers that you don't want, for example. That doesn't it, tackle it, the it, whole, whole whole picture, but I mean, it's one direction to go, maybe. Yeah. I mean, there is no need to build a new kernel if you can just remove the modules. That's what I'm trying to say. The detail kind of here is that it's not just about removing a couple of drivers we don't want. It's about removing all the drivers apart from, you know, five, six ones we want. So. I think another point is that you still need the vendor to sign the whole package, even all packages with all combinations of certain modules removed. Hi, Daniel, Daniel here on the phone. Um, I just wanted to make the point that I don't think we actually need to disable the drivers at build time. All we actually need is the ability to um, attest whether any unexpected hardware has been exposed to the guest. So if, if we can if we can have um, some mechanism to um, have measurements of all of the device models that are exposed to the OS, then um, the attestation can be used to prove that nothing unexpected was present. That is dynamic. That can change. I mean, so you, can, you can have an ongoing dynamic attestation. So what I'm trying to say is that, that state, I mean, we have PCI hot plug and things like that. So that state of, of what is exposed to the guest is dynamic. So at the moment we are test and at the next second, the situation is different. So I don't understand how that would work. Well, limit, limiting the ability to do, to respond to hot plug is, is a simpler task than disabling all drivers and having completely custom 
kernel builds and images. I, th I think from a, from a distro point of view, I uh, from a distro point of view, I don't think it's it's viable to consider building completely custom kernels, nor even really building completely custom images, which limits the installation of certain modules. I think I think it's far more practical just to just uh, attest to what's present and and maybe have some limited filters to to disable use of hot plug, perhaps. Do people see like let's say okay this might be like alternatives we're talking about, but do people have like objections on the device filter approach and actually this runtime filtering of the devices? And what kind of the angles we haven't thought about? I don't have an objection. I, I think that I think that allow listing the drivers makes a lot of sense for like the the cloud use case. Like the cloud providers have a very limited set of drivers that they're mm -hmm. using. Verdeo, NVMe, et cetera. It's easier for us to focus on those two drivers, attest that the kernel is only ever going to take input from those drivers than to try to harden everything or, or try to, uh, I agree, the dynamic attestation of what hardware is exposed seems seems difficult. So, so this, yeah. this seems like a, a good approach and, and one that we would like to present to our customers. I wanted to add on the threat model. I mean, I think um, there were some questions. I think if we, take this confidential computing to the limit, then you would assume that most VMs are running confidential, which means most secrets are hosted in those customer VMs, which means that, I mean, and the attacks like this have been shown in the past on other confidential computing environments where people will attack those interfaces of existing code inside them to cause it to spill secrets, right? I mean, that that would be sort of the taken to the limit. Um, so I, I think this, this is a good goal to achieve in terms of the other question I, or comment I had was in terms of, yes, we can eliminate driver with various mechanisms. Whatever code remains also needs to be hardened, the allowed stuff, right? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, and and, and I, I don't have time. I have like links and I'll upload this full slide deck at the end. So we have actually spent a lot of effort on hardening. For us, it's a Virtio. So for TDX case, it's a Virtio driver. So we have developed the fuzzing set of fuzzing tools and an audit methodology to actually develop a way that anyone can use to harden any of these drivers because we understand that you know we use one set of drivers google use different set of drivers and so on so yeah we have a plan for that allow set of drivers as well so but right. it's in order to kind of claim that like we are secure we need to also kind of exclude all the rest because we can't we can't use that methodology to harden we can't fuzz all this you know how many drivers we have and the upstream kernel. So it's, it, it simply doesn't scale. So that's true. That's right. Yeah. That's what I was getting to that. There are some other generic hardening tech hardening techniques that might apply to non-confidential and confidential VMs equally. That might be also useful to ensure that those drivers are built with those kinds of configurations. Like for example, has some kind of CFI mechanism being turned on for those drivers that are included right? and doesn't apply to just confidential VMs. It applies to non-confidential also. Yeah, so so a lot of hardening techniques, or most of the hardening, the traditional hardening techniques, where they, they stay and they're also like applicable for the confidential VM. But like the things that I'm trying to bring attention here is to the new parts, because these are the new parts we haven't hardened before. So makes sense. And I guess I'm out of time, right? So, right, Georg? So I'm out of time, right? Or yeah, it's now time for the break. Thanks, Elena, for the presentation and the discussion. Mm -hmm. So we now have a break before, before the next session starts, and the next session starts at 12.10. So enjoy your break, and see you back then. Robin is looking for you. <laughs> <laughs>
getting good at that fast, Tim. <laughs> it's not a good reason why we're getting fast at it. <laughs> Would love to do that once a day. My mask smells like pancakes. Is that that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> Okay, Dylan, are you hearing me? Yay! Okay, let me throw my headphones on. And let me test this. All right. Second. Okay. Check, check, check. You are hearing me, though. Okay, go ahead and talk for me. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Are you hearing me? Yes, I am. Keep talking. Okay, I'm talking. It's going to get really confusing really quick because I can hear myself back in my ears. If you said that. That's fine. Go ahead and mute yourself now. Is that, uh, and then actually I just keep really... talking. Yeah, do you hear me? The and keep talking. I can. Okay, I just realized this was probably creating a feedback loop with your headphones on, so because I got the earbuds in. It was. How's that level for you? Um, level. Let me figure out. Let me pull out an earbud real quick. Real quick. So is it still? It's lower though. Okay. Uh, yes, it was. How are we compared to yesterday? Right now. Right. Um, it sounded okay. good to me. That's what we wanted. Okay, Dylan, we are done, my friend. Okay, you were you weren't talking to me. All right, I understand. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye.
So, Tim, you're already back. Ah, there he is. So, welcome back, everyone, to the second part of the Confidential Computing Microconference. Next presentation is from Samuel about attestation and verification. Hey, everyone. So, I'm Samuel Ortiz. Uh, I work for Rivos, and today I'm going to talk about attestation and verification. And um, this morning, we've, we've been talking a lot about uh, attestation, but, uh, well, actually, we, we haven't talked a lot about attestation. We kind of eluded the, the, the topic and say, yeah, there's some attestation going on somewhere. And um, I'm, I'm part of the Confidential Containers project. And we worked a lot on the node side on how you get the attestation reports, how you, um, how you, you uh, measure things, how you, well, the, the whole flow in the node side. And then at some point we were like, okay, we have this attestation report and we need to send it somewhere because we need, uh, for those who are not familiar with Confidential Containers, it's confidential computing for containers, and basically we run the, the whole confidential container dance to get a container image encryption key back from a key brokering service uh, to decrypt the container image and run it as a Kubernetes workload. So we did, we did all this, and at some point we had this attestation report, and we were thinking, well, we need to set in somewhere uh, to get this key uh, to some hypothetical entity that will parse this attestation report and verify it and test it, appraise it, and send us some key back so that we can decrypt our container image and move on and, and run our container workload. And this is where we started to realize that this was a very special space. Attestation services, uh, it's, it's something that uh, kind of the elephant in our confidential computing room. We don't really talk about it. We assume it's working. And today I want to talk about this and what we're doing in confidential containers to try to, try to simplify this space. Uh, this is the definition from, uh, for confidential computing from the, uh, at the, this, one of the CCC white paper. And I think um, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we're looking at, again at the, at the node side. How do we protect memory? How do we actually measure things? How do we do measure boot and everything? Um, but if we only think about uh, confidential computing as a way of protecting memory, um, we're losing the main point, I think, of confidential computing because we're not actually, um, uh, we, we, we don't have a way to trust who generates and uses th this memory that we're trying to protect. And this is the whole point of attestation and verification. And basically, confidential computing without attestation and verification is not really confidential. Uh, you generate a lot of data, you protect it, but you have no idea who is using it, and you, you cannot trust these, those entities. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we've been talking a lot about the node side, how to protect the guest, how, how, to, well, uh, how to run the guest, uh, but there's this other side of the equation that we also need to solve. This is our main focus, as I said. We'll, we've been talking about a lot about this, this part of the confidential computing space. Um, how do we build a guest kernel? How do we uh, uh, harden this guest kernel? Uh, how we, do we get an evidence? Uh, there's been talk about the, uh, the dice attestation flow, and this was mostly about how do you generate a, a report how do you, uh, from, from, uh, from, a guest, uh, from a guest workload, from a guest TBM or CBM, whatever the uh, terminology is. How do you generate this, this uh, device identity? And well, basically, this is our main focus. And I think, what we tend to forget is that there's some magic box out there in the cloud somewhere, or even in the same node as where you're running your workload, that is doing stuff for you. Uh, you send this evidence that you put so much effort into generating, and this magic box sends you something back, a protected resource that you want to use for decrypting your, your hard drive, uh, decrypting your container image, establishing a secure channel between you and some other services. But this is, this is what we tend to think about when we think about confidential computing. And this magic box here is humongous. It's pretty big, and it's very difficult to interact with. This is our experience in the, uh, that, we, that, we see, that we saw in the uh, 
confidential continuous project. This magic box is called the relying party, or this is what the IATF uh, tends to call it. And basically, that's the high level flow, and this is how we see it again. Uh, we have this TVM or the, the CVM, the confidential virtual, uh, virtual machine, generates an evidence, send it to this uh, relying party, get something back, a secret. Everything works. Actually, not that easy. The relying party, first of all, is going to have to verify what you send it. So there's another entity that works with the relying party, which is called the verifier. And the relying party forwards the evidence to the verifier, which responsibility is, responsibility is to actually verify the, um, the evidence. If the evidence is verified, authenticated, attested, then it sends attestation results to the relying party. And based on those attestation results, the relying party decides if it wants to inject the secret back to the TVM or not. So this magic box is already getting more complicated with this. But it's not the end of it. Uh, the verifier uh, has, needs some way to actually verify the attestation results, or the, uh, sorry, the, the evidence that it gets from the relying party. So there's yet another entity, which is called the uh, a, a reference values provider, that kind of holds the golden values, the measurements that you're going to verify your attestation uh, evidence against. So this reference value provider is uh, if uh, uh, the verifier talks to, to this entity to actually get the golden values and be able to make a comparison or some sort of comparison, uh, a full comparison or a partial comparison between the evidence and those golden values. So you have yet another entity uh, that uses reference measurements to talk back to the verifier. Not the end of it. This reference value provider needs to be fed with actual reference values. Where are those reference values coming from? Well, this is your kernel measurement. This is your OVMF measurement. This is your initRD measurement. This is your kernel command line measurement. This is all your measurement. This is everything that you actually built as artifacts of your confidential virtual machine. So that gets back to the supply chain. How do you generate your artifacts that are going to, to be actually running your confidential guest? So we have now this TVM supply chain, which is an entire new problem for us that actually generates value. And you need to trust this, this supply chain. So that's another, that's another question. How do you trust the supply chain? When you generate a kernel that you're going to run as a guest kernel on your confidential fed into the verifier. So typically, uh, I don't know, a high-level policy that you can think about. And the policy that the vendor gave me says, yes, they match, and this is the only, the only key that you can fit, that you can provision the, 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 the CVM. So the, this whole simple hand wavy relying party box, magic box that we had there, it's a lot more complex than, than we, we, we thought about. And it's, it's complex in the sense that it's, it's very difficult to interact with. 
all those flow there that you see, um, they're not extremely well defined. There's a lot of fragmentation in that space. And I'm gonna go through all this to understand where this fragmentation is coming from. First of all, you, your computational virtual machine is generating an attestation evidence and everyone is happy with this. And as I said, we work very hard to make sure that this actually works nicely and that we can trust this. How do you send this evidence to the, to the relying part? What is this, the format of, of this evidence? So those are two basic questions. When you get this evidence, and this is really the first problem that we faced when, when doing confidential containers, we're getting an evidence from, from SNP or from TDX or from, from PF. How do you send it to, to where? What is, what is the interface to send it somewhere? And we realized that if you want to send it to Alibaba's at the station service, you're going to have to follow a given protocol. If you want to send it to Azure, you're going to follow another protocol. And if you want to, to send it to ICICL, uh, Intel's TDX uh, at station service, you're going to follow yet another protocol. So each and every one of those services are, in the best case, service specific. In the worst case, they're service, manufacturer, vendor specific. So the combination of all protocols that you need to support as a, as a, a confidential virtual machine implementation, as a workload, are exponential. Then the format of the evidence obviously is, well, each and every vendor out there has its own format. And by own format, I really mean it's not an, a format that en encapsulated in some sort of definition of this format. It's a raw format that the, the, the vendors give you, and this is what you're supposed to send to, to your relying part. So both the, the protocol and how you send the, the evidence and the format of the evidence is completely, well, depending on the vendor, depending on the manufacturer, depending on the, on the, on the relying party that you're gonna use, they're completely different. Then the secret that you get back from this relying party is also how do you get back, how do you get that back? How do you parse this as a, as a workload? As a, I mean, our customers, the customers that are gonna use the confidential computing hardware, they're gonna receive a secret back. What, how do they know to parse it? What, what does it mean to them? Completely depends on the, on, the, on the relying party and the attestation service that they're gonna use. Then on the verifier side, um, the verifier actually needs to talk back to the, to the manufacturer. The verifier gets the attestation evidence and it's typically signed with a key that is rooted back into a manufacturer certificate. And it needs to talk back to the, the, the manufacturer. Uh, when you get a TDX uh, evidence, you need to talk back to somehow Intel's uh, 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 key generation service to verify that yes, it's been signed by a key that you can trust. So the verifier needs to plug into a set of manufacturer-specific implementations. If you, want, if you want yourself to implement an attestation service, you're going to have to face all of this. For each and every TE that you want to support, you're going to have to implement specific protocols to talk to your manufacturer back. Uh, the format of the policies that the, the, the policies that I talked about that you're going to that you can fed the, the verifier uh, with those are also uh, uh, completely different based on what the verifier implementation expects. If you're running iCycle or the Intel TDX uh, attestation service or SGX attestation service, you're going to use a certain set of format, a policy format, if they call it policies. Um, everything is, is different depending on the manufacturer. And on the end flow, um, how, is, how does the, um, um, the supply chain that generates your uh, artifacts, the thing that you're actually going to run on your workload, your kernel, your initRD, your OVMF binary, how does this supply chain feed your reference value provider? Uh, um, what's the format? What do we use? What's the protocol to, for those two entities to talk, uh, to, talk uh, to each other? This is... This is defined, but for each and every uh, attestation service, again, it's different. So we have a lot of uh, questions here. We have a lot of question mark, and we have a lot of fragmentation. And yeah, platform enabling, uh, basically everything that we talked about this morning is only one piece of the equation. There's a very large one that we never th talk about that is completely, we hand wave about it, about it basically, and we, we just assume that it's going to work. But all the effort that we put on platform enabling are useless if we don't fix the other, the other side of the equation. That's, that's what the message that I want to carry here. 
um, the interfaces, the protocol, the, the manufacturer inter interactions for the whole attestation flow is very fragmented. Um, it's usually manufacturer and cloud service specific. And I, I want to call out that there's a, 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 a group in IATF called RATS that is trying to build specification and start standardization for, for uh, the attestation service. So there's an ongoing effort from the IETF to, to actually um, uh, standardize this. And really plumbing, basically the, 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 the problem that we're facing here is that platform generates an evidence, that's cool, and we work really hard on this, but plumbing this evidence on any given attestation service is very challenging. And I, I, can, I can talk about it by experience. We try to plumb the evidence that we get from a confidential container workload into any given attestation service, it's very difficult. You need to have a custom implementation as a client for each and every attestation service that you want to talk to. So what is our approach to this? Um, we're trying to, um, well, our approach is basically trying to fix that problem by implementing something that is generic and open. Uh, we want to have generic and open interfaces, and we want to build a, an attestation service that is pluggable for each and every vendor to plug, for example, their verifier implementation. So we have a, um, we, we are defining a, uh, a relying party protocol, the protocol that as a, as a, as a uh, CVM, as a cloud, uh, uh, sorry, as a confidential virtual machine workload, you're gonna talk to and you're gonna send your evidence to, uh, and you're gonna get a, a response back with a secret, uh, with a protected resource. We are defining a generic uh, manufacturer agnostic uh, protocol for For verifying your attestation evidence. And the, um, the, the reference value provider service, uh, we're trying to also make it manufacturer agnostic uh, and have it depend on modern and open source supply chain architecture. Basically, uh, the one that's currently dominant, which is in total, and that generates SLSA uh, 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 provenance. If you, if you have a supply chain that follows this format, we're going to be able to interact with this. So, okay, I'm gonna move forward. And I'm, yeah, here I'm basically calling out for standardization. Uh, and I'm basically describing how those, all those question marks could be solved by following a few of the, of the, of the, of the specification and, and protocols that I just talked about. And I want to call out for simplification. And we have a lot of people here working on, uh, for hardware manufacturers defining maybe the next generation of confidential computing hardware. And here we can start thinking about making the next uh, confidential computing software stack simpler. 
uh, by simplifying the interfaces between, between the TBM and the relying party, and by simplifying the interfaces in between the relying party and the supply chain. And basically, if you look at this very complex picture, you can simplify it by doing this. You have this giant box, which is an attestation service that you feed an evidence into, and some reference value coming from a supply chain. If you basically follow those few protocol, uh, the, the KBS protocol that I just talked about, which is just a proposal, and I uh, encourage everyone in, in this room to go and, and look at this protocol and, and comment and tell us if it's generic enough for supporting as many use cases, as many uh, attestation use cases as possible. If you use a DICE or an uh, entity attestation token format for your evidence, if you send a, a JSON web formatted uh, uh, token or key for your uh, a, a provi uh, a provision uh, secret, and if you use something like Intoto that generates VLSA provenance uh, for your uh, reference value, just by doing this, basically you could have a confidential virtual machine uh, being able to interact with much more attestation services that we can do today. So that's my call out for this, uh, for this presentation. I don't, we're out of time, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's time for the last question, for one question. this whole right-hand side, why does it have to be dynamic? Why can't you just attach a, a hash on a certificate to the kernel in their D and every other thing that is involved? I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the beginning of your question, sir. Why is the right-hand side of your graph dynamic? Why, why, do you, why, why can't we just attach static? Uh, the right-hand side of, this, yes. of this, this, this diagram here? Yes. Uh, because you want, you want, I mean, your, 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 all your artifacts are in, in, that are going to be running on the confidential virtual machine are going to be generated somewhere in a supply chain that some, some, sometime you fully control, or sometime you don't fully control, but you want to be able to trust. Right, so, so let's say that you generate a kernel, and once you generate it, you sign it, then it, you don't Who is, who is you? Well, whoever generates the kernel signs the kernel, right? I mean, we, Right, so every every artifact, every you artifact answer, that you're going to you run sign in, it, in, and then you just check the signature locally without going out to some other service. It's it's not only about it's not only about uh, signing the artifact. It's also about uh, verifying that all the steps that you had to go through to generate those artifacts are actually the one that you expect. It's not only um, only about signing something and 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 verifying unless you you can actually provide a fully reproducible build of your entire confidential virtual machine which I think is far away from anything that we can do today. If you can't, prov if you can't have this guarantee, unless you have a very simple workload, if you, you usually cannot provide this guarantee, what you want, to, what you want to, to ver be able to verify is that all your build steps have been followed exactly as you expect. So you start from a, a, a source a code that you can verify, it, and then you build it exactly in the same way that you expect. And you sign the, the generated artifact, and you have the guarantee that not only your, uh, your artifact is signed by someone, something that you trust, but the, it's been generated by following the exact step that you, that you want to follow. So this is the, this is the role of the, of the uh, of like in Toto, for example, will give you that, that, that feature. You, you give it a manifest, a build manifest. It's not only about which source code I'm gonna use and who is gonna sign it. It's, it's about how do you go from this source code to an actual binary? Which steps uh, uh, I'm supposed to follow and which Actors are going to be follow, um, are going to be pushing the buttons to actually do the build, and you you have a, a guarantee that you have a, 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 at the end you get a, a prominence that's that's called a prominence which is a signed manifest showing you each and every step that you went through to generate the artifact that you signed, so you can trust the entire supply chain. Okay, I think it's time to uh, wrap this discussion up. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Next up uh, is Jackie, who presents uh, remotely. Jackie, you are now presenter. Okay. Uh, is it possible to switch to my slides? 
or do I need the, to upload it myself? You can select your slides and. Uh, okay, let me figure out how I, how I can uh, upload the. Oh, okay, I find it. Uh, this one. Okay. So can I start so, uh, now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jackie Lee from Google. And today my talk is about identifying and eliminating contention from booting concurrent SMP VNs. Uh, okay, so this talk will be organized in two parts. First, I will give some background on the experiment setup and explain how we identify the contention. In the second part, we will focus on one of the possible solutions that remove the log contention at the software level. And then we will discuss how we can generally deal with the contention when a piece of hardware is overcommitted. For example, re-limiting the resource request from the guest. Okay, so um, first, uh, what is an SMP VN? Some of you might already know this term, but for those who are not familiar with it, just one sentence, SMP is a short name for SCV SMP, which stands for Secure Encrypted Virtualization uh, dash Secure Nested Paging. This is an advanced memory encryption technology provided by AMD. And compared to its previous generations, SCV SMP adds new hardware-based security protections, which we will talk about this new hardware a little bit later. So naturally, we run tons of tests before qualifying the new technologies like SMP. And one of them is measuring the boot time performance of gas VNs. Basically, we boot a couple of VNs at the same time and measure the time from issuing the command to bring up the VN to the time VN enters the gas UV. And we draw this picture to show the relationship between the number of VNs booting concurrently and the average boot time for all VNs. So as you can see in this graph, uh, this graph sh sh uh, in the slides shows an interesting finding that the boot time of VN is actually increased when we have more VNs booting together. And this is actually specific to SMP VNs. For normal VN, we will actually see a flat horizontal line. So what happens? Like why are those SMP VNs so special? We investigated and found from the log that those VNs are uh, literally spending most of its time booting, uh, its booting time to initiate the RMP entries in a loop. Okay, so uh, what is an RMP? And why does the SMP VN needs this extra step for initialization? RMP stands for reverse map table. And this is actually the new hardware introduced in the SMP to provide strong memory integrity protection. This piece of hardware is used to check the owner of every page in the memory to make sure that only the owner of the pages can write it. And when initializing a new guest VN, the hypervisor would need to issue a new x86 instructions called RMP update to make sure the memory is registered under this new guest VN. And after realizing that RMP update might cause the problem, we changed the experiment setup a little bit to investigate this new behavior in SMP. So instead of bringing up multiple VNs, we actually started multiple kernel threads looping on the RMP update function in the background and measure the average boot uh, VM boot time. So the graph in the right corner shows that the more threads we uh, doing RMP updates, the longer it takes to boot a VN. By the way, this graph is on a log scale, so it's a linear correlation. From the graph, we can see that there is a contention when doing RMP updates across different threads. Hmm. So now it's time to zoom in a little bit to, in the code to see what happens inside the RMP update function. This pseudo code shows that this helper function is not only calls the new x86 instructions in assembly code, but also do some tricks to modify the direct map. So basically, we need to manipulate the page table to make sure that it sync with the RMP table in terms of the page size. And the direct map change provide extra security protections as well. For more details, uh, you, can find it, uh, you can find it in the discussion in the mailing list. For now, we will actually focus on the things going on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we actually end up finding 
both functions that update the page table will eventually call into a helper function called change page attribute. And this whole change page attribute function is protected behind a global spin lock uh, called, uh, called CPA lock for every single request to change the page attribute. And actually this, this doesn't smell right because we actually changing the attribute of different pages when booting concurrent VMs, okay? So naturally, uh, our first thought is, can we actually remove the lock as it seems unnecessary? Before digging more into the code, to the whole, start, uh, to the whole history and the structure, we just remove it and did, did the experiment again. Surprisingly, there's no crash, no misbehave function. And as you can see from the red line in the graph, we got much, much better performance. This lock seems to be the key factor that slows down the performance. So now the real challenge is, can we actually remove it? So after investigating more in the code, we think we can we actually can remove it without introducing safety issues. So that's that's uh, first. Let's go back to 2008 and see why this lock was introduced in the first place. From the commit message, it said that uh, the lock is introduced to solve a race condition where it's possible that one CPU is splitting the large page for changing attribute, uh, while the other CPU can also use the stale TLB entries to do another different attributes changing. So in this diagram, at first, CPU 0 and CPU 1 both have the TLB translations for the 2000 address, whose page size is 2 megabytes and has attribute X. And then, CPU zero tries to split the page to 4K and change the attribute to Y. While in the same time, the CPU one tries to change the page attribute to Z, according to the spec, it's possible that the TLB may subsequently contain both ordinary and large page translations for the same edges. And this is a real case, but when it happens, again, according to the spec in the commit message, it said that the CPU would have undefined behavior and can use neither of the translations in the TLB. So an undefined behavior from the CPU is definitely something we would like to avoid. But looking closer in the code, we actually found that this exact race condition has already been protected by another global spin lock called PGD lock today, thanks to a patch in 2018 that moves the TLB flash from outside of PGD lock to inside. So this is a comparison between the code flow from 2008 and the code flow after 2018. Uh, hopefully this pseudo code inside the change page attribute function won't be hard to read. So in the first block read by the PGD log, it's trying to change the attribute of the large page, which is what CPU one is trying to is doing. And in the second block read by the PGD log, it's trying to split the large page if needed and then change the attribute to the 4K page after releasing the PGD log, which is what CPU zero is doing. So in the left side of the, uh, so in the left side on the 2008 code, it's possible that after PGD unlock and before the TLB flash, the CPU zero has already split the large page and at the same time, the CPU one is changing the attribute of this large page. And this will lead to the race condition and two different translations in TLB and undefined behavior in the processor. However, in the right side on the 2018 code, there won't, this won't be happening because the CPU one would actually wait until the global TLB flush to change the attribute. And after the global TLB flush and the CPU zero release the log, CPU one would not pass the check for changing the attribute for large page last one reached the code point for changing the attribute. So why did that patch make this change? I think the patch in 2018 was trying to do another optimize, to do an optimization for another problem. And the patch also mentioned in the commit message that this does put the global invalidate under the PGD log, but that shouldn't matter. Interestingly, this does, that does matter in our case. Okay. And uh, that's what we got so far. And interestingly, even after removing the CPA lock, we can still see the degradation on the boot time when having multiple threads doing RMP updates. Although it's not a lin linear again, uh, this, it's not linear anymore. Uh, it's still a 50% increase when there are uh, 64 threads doing RMP updates in the background. There can be many follow-ups 
one possibility is that the PGD log can actually be further optimized to a per PMD log, or it could be some hardware bottleneck, which is more generic topic for the overcommitment hardware. We think there, this uh, might be handled by some kind of rate limit enforcement, but there are definitely more experiments and explorations to go. Uh, one thing we want to call out here is that there are actually some patches in the mailing list called lazy accept, which might able to help might be able to help to spread the RMP updates across the VN life cycle instead of being crowded into the boot time during the boot time. This might also help to mitigate the issue. Okay, that's pretty much all the uh, the uh, content of my talk, and uh, in uh, we, we would like I uh, we will be sending out the patch to remove the CPA lock soon, and it will be great to uh, get some feedback in this talk, and we also would like to collect some thoughts about optimizing PG lock to per PMD lock, and as well as some thoughts on handling this hardware uh, resource over commitment uh, systematically, yeah, and. Uh, Lastly, uh, we would like to thank everyone that makes this talk possible, uh, including David Kaplan, Bridget Singh, Fran van der Linden, and David Rianches. Okay, that's, let me go back to the previous discussions uh, and take questions here. Any questions? So um, when you remove the CPA log, wouldn't you see the quotation then on the PG log? That's yeah. That's why you want to split it up, right? Uh, actually, yeah. yeah. And actually, that's that's our guess right now. Like we haven't did the experiment to to actually uh, factorize the uh, to actually optimize PG log to per PND log. But we do feel, uh, uh, by scanning the code, we do think that uh, is it will actually uh, mitigate the issue by having per PMD log, yeah. You haven't tried that yet, you don't have the per PMD log implemented yet, right? Right, yeah, we haven't got this implemented. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to see. Totally agree. <laughs> so I, I was talking to Dave Hansen at the break and I don't, Dave, did, did you leave? I don't think I see him here. Um, they, they, he had some concern that CPUs have, in the past, have often had bugs in the sort of uh, the multi-match uh, case, right, where you have the 4K and the TMAG page. And so his feedback was that even if the manual says that um, it won't cause a problem, he doesn't want to take that risk. Uh, so. I mean, another potential option, right, would be sort of a, a break before make, I think, right? If you were to uh, mark the entry that you're trying to use invalid, flush the TLB, and then mark the new entry valid, is that something you guys have thought about? Uh, actually, that's a good idea. We haven't. But uh, going back to the first concern here, I think uh, th the thing is that uh, this this PG log has already actually protect uh, uh, has already avoid the race condition that uh, mentioned in the previous uh, commit message. So I don't think there will be uh, even though after uh, even after removing the CPA log, there shouldn't be race condition uh, mentioned. Uh, this specific race condition where one CPU is you know splitting the large page and changing attribute, the other CPU is just changing the attribute. Uh, so even even after removing a CPA lock, this there won't be there still won't be any race condition about that scenario. So I guess that's I don't know that 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 might not uh, that might not imply that and we need uh, to take care of the some CPU uh, bugs, right? I see. Yeah, but but it, I guess if you want to get rid of the PGD lock, then you would have to. Uh, oh right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I was also. Uh, this working. I, I, I was going to comment that uh, uh, coming back to Dave Hansen's concern, I wonder if we're more confident the the current CPU generations work the way the manual describes. If we could have code in there that says, you know, if your CPU is this generation, then don't do the lock. I don't you know. You got to convince him of that. I, I got the feeling he wouldn't be easily convinced, but.
Uh, something else we can do is we can try to <laughs> dig in Git history and see what exactly caused the introduction of the CPA, CPA lock and then try running the patch removing the lock on those CPUs who actually had the problem and see whether that, whether that's still going to be okay. But I'm not sure we're going to find all the details. And I think the problem is this code is probably not called very often before SMP. So, yeah, I don't know that you know, it can be easily tested. Uh, so actually some details on our side, uh, we, uh, we actually uh, try to remove the, C, uh, remove the CPA log in uh, some of our test machines. And we did uh, the test, I, I think we did thousands of tests and, and mm, during like a couple of weeks. And we didn't see any uh, uh, CPU crashes or you know, kernel, kernel panic or anything related to this, uh, this removal of CPA log. So that actually gives us some confidence that, okay, it's, it, it might be okay to remove the CPA log. But again, this is just, uh, this is, uh, this 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 can be a uh, this race condition can be a rare case so i don't know maybe it can happen uh, much less often than a couple of weeks thousands of tests within a couple of weeks yeah problem is you probably need old hardware which uh, you probably uh, and the other problem is if something fails if there's not a machine check to get raised about it it might even get silent you know like silently a corrupted lookup and how do you detect that? that that makes sense yeah but actually uh going back to the very first question here i i think we have already dig into the uh the, the good history of uh of why we introduced the cpa log and uh it, i think it's kind of clear in in the commit message that it's trying to solve one this specific race condition and by yeah i think by an static analysis on the code like we should be able to get rid of this race condition as well, right? I think Boris is saying we should need to take it a step further and not just read the commit description, but actually see what hardware that they got the issue on and see if we can reproduce the error they got and then run the testing. Uh, is, yeah. Makes sense, yeah. 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 I mean, at least for us in Sorry, David. I think it, the connection is not good. I'm not able to hear your question. For SMP, mm -hmm. we know the oldest hardware we can run on isn't very old. So it's the limit. The he's breaking up. I'm pretty sure he's saying basically Jackie ran thousands of tests. I, I, Jackie ran it, I believe, on the AMD N3. So I think what David's trying to say is we know we can be confident that we can remove CPA lock just for the, the this generation of hardware. Right? For, similar to the comment I made earlier, we can condition the removal on the. Right, that would be super ideal. Yeah. Like uh, we can, if we know like when in back in 2008, 2008, like what, which, which CPU family is having this, uh, this risk and this undefined behavior when there's uh, multiple translations in TLB, we can definitely, you know, condition on the, on, on those uh, CPU families or generations to remove the CPA law. Yeah, definitely. Uh, from, from past experience, I know Linux doesn't like conditional locks. Doesn't like if la lock. Ah, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to to justify. Okay, um, I think it's time to wrap this discussion up. Thanks, Jackie, for your presentation. Um, next is um, Sagi, which will talk about uh, TDX self tests.
Uh, hello, I'm Sagi from the Google Confidential Recruiting Team. I'm going to talk about our experience with testing TDX using a set of self-tests that we wrote. So if you're looking at TDX development streams, obviously we have a lot of different components that are being developed in different times, different, uh, different patches. We have, the, we have the CPU, BIOS, with the TDX model. We have the TDX host kernel, UFI, guest kernel, user space VMM. These are all components that need basically to work together in order to boot a single TDVM. And obviously, if one of them fails, the entire system fails. And oftentimes, you have no idea what actually happened. So basically, trying to test the entire system with a, with a single VM boot test is something that is very difficult. Now, in Google, we actually be, uh, wrote and used a set of uh, self-tests to test the TDX environment. We've been using T TDX self-tests for about a year internally. Sent the first uh, RFC patch upstream last year and sent V2 with additional tests and capabilities last month. We recently uh, uploaded our uh, internal development for self-test into a GitHub, which is open and we'll we welcome. test of the components that, that we did have to make sure they were mostly used for basically the host kernel and the TDX model. So basically we got some uh, uh, better hardware and we wanted to make sure that the host kernel that we actually got is something that can not necessarily boot an entire uh, and run an entire VM, but at least be able to start TDX and do some very basic manip memory manipulation to make sure that, that all, all the, ho the host patches are actually correct. Now, after that, we started exploring more uh, the spec. Mo uh, most, mostly, we were initially, we were focused on the GHCI protocol, which if you're from the AMD side, this is basically equivalent to the GHCB. So this is the ghost, uh, sorry, guest host com uh, communication interface. It, it defines a lot of very specific functions and how they should behave. So that get, basically gave us some entry point to test the TDX implementation. We were testing things like a uh, CPU ID, IO, MMIO, and MSR uh, register uh, access. And one of the interesting things, one of the interesting things we actually uncovered during this uh, self-test is something that I really want to focus on which is an actual access bug in the MSR uh, access uh, uh, code pattern. So when we were looking at the RFC v5 that Intel sent, the code for uh, uh, accessing MSR was very simple. Basically, TDX, you have TDX uh, emulate uh, read MSR. Inside it, you have the KVM get MSR. Very simple code. And when, when this text, uh, patch was introduced, in March of this year, March 4th of this year, it was perfectly correct. Now, the thing is that three days later, someone actually introduced a different patch 
to the KVM upstream that modified the, the behavior of KVM get MSR. This function, which was used in the previous uh, Intel TDX patch, was actually modified. So now the new function no longer checks whether the uh, uh, MSR access is allowed. So as you can see, these two lines in purple were actually removed from the patch. They were actually removed from KVM get MSR. So KVM get MSR no longer checks if the MSR access is allowed. Instead, there is now a new uh, MSR uh, uh, get, get MSR function, which is called KVM get MSR with filter, which does the, which, which behaves like the previous uh, get MSR function, which actually tests the, the filter. So, up, so when Intel actually sent RFC v6 of the patch with the exact same code, which was already reviewed and approved and even even had uh, approved by by uh, Paolo, by the maintainer, they didn't obviously they didn't fit, uh, they, they didn't change the code. But this patch was already incorrect because someone else made a change in a completely different function in the KVM. No one even saw the difference between these two. The, the, so no one saw, saw the correlation between these two patches. In RFC v6, now you have a, a TDX emulator read MSR, which calls the incorrect get MSR and basically doesn't check whether this uh, MSR access is, is, is allowed by the guest. Now, the important thing about this bug is this is the kind of bugs that basically can't be caught by the traditional uh, testing mechanisms. So basically, it's something that obviously the developer didn't notice because when the developer wrote the code, the code was correct. Same goes for the code review because when everyone um, uh, uh, reviewed the code in the original RFC v5 patch, the, the code was correct. If you try to run any of the standard tests of running a VM, try to see if it boots, obviously everything, everything works correctly. But what you have here is an access violation. As so as long as you run a standard VM that is doing, doing what it's supposed to do, you're not going to get in, uh, into any, any issues. But this is a serious bug that can lead to access violation. This mean, basically, this bug means that the guest can access both read and write, by the way, the example was for read, but the same bug also appeared in the right MSR uh, path. Now the guest can actually access MSR registers that it's not supposed to be able to do. So this is the kinds of bugs that can only be caught in this kind of self-test. And this is one of the key points of this uh, talk, I think. So we have a lot of different testing mechanisms. We have a lot of people running VMs and running end-to-end -end tests. We don't have a lot of testing uh, environment that actually able to test this kind of very specific behaviors and making sure that all, all of our uh, code implementation actually matches the spec and doing exactly what it's, what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now let's go on to the different areas that we already so tested. So as I said, we were also using the self test for reproducers and extra cases, which was very nice for, this, for the self test because we can easily uh, control both the hosts and host and the guest in order to do very specific uh, memory access manipulation. So we can, uh, in a single test, you can basically make the host and the guest access the same memory, whether it's private or shared. You can control the entire environment and you can uh, uh, test very, very specific edge cases that often can't be uh, tested in any other way. So for example, here we can do stuff like uh, access the guest uh, private EPT tables from the, host, uh, from the host side, which is something that if you're not talking into a, uh, looking at a self-test environment, this basically requires you to modify your host kernel just to, to, to be able to reproduce this very uh, weird corner case. Right, so this is something that no one outside of self-test self is going to write a test where your host kernel is trying to mali 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 uh, maliciously write into the guest private EPT tables. This is something that we were fairly easily be able to do in a self-test, but it's something that you practically, at most, someone can basically run it once with the modified kernel, 
it's not something that anyone is going to run continuously. But again, for in a selfless environment where we basically can control everything, this is something that is a lot uh, more easily uh, done. And the last thing that we are using in Cephas is actually new feature development. So like I said, like I said in the first slide, whenever you have a new feature, you have a lot of different components that you need to write. Now, the, the same also goes when you have a new feature that you're trying to develop. Uh, one of the features that we are actually looking at right now is copyless or in-place migration. So basically what happens is, you have a VM running on the host, but you want to update either the host, uh, parts of the host. Let's say you want to update the VMM into a new version of VM VMM. Uh, so now you want to have a running VM that is moving from one VMM into another VMM. Now, in order to do that, you need to basically uh, have both KVM and VMM and maybe other parts of the, your environment changed. And it's very hard to debug when you already have a fu very full VM running and you're trying to migrate it. Because the, ex the access pattern might be indeterministic. You have no idea what's going on. There's a lot of features that are running at uh, the same time. But with a self-test, what we were actually able to do, we were able to basically divide this uh, feature development into multiple parts and test each part uh, separately. So initially, we were just implementing the KVM code that should handle the migration and test it using a self-test without actually having any changes to the VMM. And even within the, K the KVM code development, we can build this feature incrementally. So initially, we can see if we can run a VM and migrate the VM that doesn't have any memory, then basically uh, have a, a migrate a VM with only private memory, then VM with, with shared memory, which is basically similar to what you have with uh, test-driven development. You keep writing more and more complicated tests, and you keep implementing more and more sophisticated features in an in, in incremental way, which very simplifies the, the way that you actually implement a new feature in the kernel. So this is basically something that is coming from the test-driven development world, and we can implement it in the kernel using the self-test. Now, uh, I'm going to give you some overview of how our self-tests look like and how they are implemented, or, or at least a, a quick glimpse of it. So, like I said, for the self-test, we are actually running, writing both the host and the guest together. So what you have is basically, you define one uh, guest function, which is the part that is running inside the guest, and you have uh, the, the test that is running in the host. And both these, these two actually work together. So if you look at the host, you basically create a new, t a new uh, TDX VM, you initialize it, add as many CPUs as you want, and then you can use this guest code, or in our case, the guest dummy exit, and basically inject this code into your uh, uh, test VM, so you're able to run it. Inside the VM, you can issue a bunch of calls that are mostly uh, using the GHCI protocol in order to communicate from the guest to the host or and vice versa. Now, like I said, so these tests are running as uh, user test applications, similarly to the regular self-tests. And they are running, yeah, I think I covered this too. Let me go over how this is actually wo uh, working behind the scene. So if you look at the, t uh, the guest function, it actually calls something uh, which we defined as TDVM call success. If you look at the right side, TDVM call success actually maps into something that we implement as TDVM call IO, which is based on the GHCI protocol for IO between host and guest. It's basically using the uh, TD call uh, function in order to send a few bytes from the guest to the host so that the guest can basically notify the host that it's, it, it, it succeeded. It writes a very specific function to a predefined port 
that the guest can that the host can verify. Inside the host, we have this check guest completion, which basically what happens is once the guest makes this TD call, in KVM, there is an exit to user space. So as part in, in the test code, we can actually uh, trap this uh, user space exit, and we can look at the exit uh, parameters for the VMN. So we can look at the exit reason, which in our case it should be KVM exit IO, and we can verify that the port and size are what we expected. So this is basically a very simple a test for running uh, just to see if we can run a VM, but this test can be expanded using and using different uh, TD calls. We can make a lot of more complicated uh, cases. So just to summarize, we found the cell test to be very useful, very simple to write and run. There can be, they are very powerful to run in uh, corner cases and negative tests, which is basically stuff that shouldn't happen in the real world, but you want to make sure that they fail gracefully and correctly. And it doesn't really require a, a full setup and full guest or UFI to run. Uh, we would appreciate a, a, a people to basically look at the RFC patch that we submitted and look at our code and maybe com contribute or add more self or more test cases or suggest test cases that we need to add. I think Intel already sent out one uh, self-test for uh, TDS capabilities that we are going to integrate. And I will open the floor for questions. Um, do you think this could integrate with the uh, KVM unit test uh, uh, no. repo? Or is it? Um, um, you, I'm, I'm just wondering if this uh, this could integrate with the uh, KVM unit test uh, repo. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the. No, so currently, this is in the mainline repo for the self tests. It's yeah. not in the KVM unit test repo. Okay. Okay. That depends on the on the KVM host support uh, for TDX, right? So the self tests depend on the on the host support for TDX being merged first, right? Oh yeah. If if yeah. you don't have a host or hardware support, then you can't run the self tests. This depends on both having the CPU capable of TD, of self test and the TDX module initialized, so it can't be run outside of TDX. If there are no more questions, then we move on to our last session for today. Uh, thanks. And the next session is from Ashish about interrupt security for AMD SCV SNP. Um, Ashish will be presenting remotely. You are no presenter. You can, by clicking on the on the plus sign in the lower corner, you can switch to your slides and uh, start when you are ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can start the session. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the SCV SNP interrupt security feature. Uh, this is actually part of the guest security uh, and guest integrity protection stuff, uh, which is already uh, mainline. And this is the next phase of uh, guest uh, in, in, uh, integrity features which are coming up. So interrupt security is, uh, is uh, another feature which is going to be added uh, uh, as an uh, as the, the, the next uh, phase of uh, uh, guest integrity protection, uh, which are coming up. So, uh, 
basically for uh, protecting against uh, this is basic it's a feature which is meant for protection against uh, uh, malicious interrupt uh, uh, or malicious event injection attacks and uh, for protection against these kind of features uh, snp provides uh, two uh, mutually exclusive features one, one is known as the restricted interrupt injection and the other is known as the alternate interrupt injection so why do we need uh, uh, interrupt or exception protection? Uh, one of the main uh, reasons why we do we do need is is uh, there could be cases uh, uh, where the the guest OS has certain assumptions about uh, interrupt behavior based on uh, just bare metal. So for example, uh, the interrupt flag is clear. The interrupts are disabled on on the guest, and the, the, there could be a a malicious hypervisor injection where interrupts could be just injected in uh, even when guest is not expecting it because the interrupt flag is clear. Or the other possibility is that the guest is running on a higher elevated TPR and uh, and a lower priority interrupt is injected by the by the by a malicious hypervisor. So the, so in such cases, a malicious hypervisor can break uh, the guest kernel platform uh, interrupt feature or the other device drivers because they are not expecting an interrupt to come in and uh, and the hypervisor can just inject a, a malicious interrupt at that point and causing uh, cause guest uh, uh, failure or breakage in, in in those specific conditions so uh, so this uh, so SNP basically adds uh, these additional features which basically you know kind of disables uh, virtual interrupt queuing and also partially disables interrupt injection interface what we now uh, uh, basically, uh, in case of restricted interrupt injection, uh, what we are doing is it's just uh, just injecting as only a specific uh, defined uh, architecture vector. For example, uh, as you as you know, on the interrupt uh, on the Intel uh, architecture, zero to thirty ex uh, vectors are exception vectors. So now vector twenty is uh, something which has been uh, used by the restricted interrupt injection feature where uh, uh, vector 28 is the only vector which is allowed to be injected in once this is features and enabled. And it just acts as a doorbell. It's, 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 uh, it's supposed all kind of interrupt queuing and information between host and guest is supposed to be done in some kind of a para virtualized manner, which for example, there could be an even queue in a shared memory. And uh, the, the injection interrupt is just like a, just like a doorbell. So as I mentioned, it's, uh, all, all the hypervisor-based interrupt queuing is kind, is kind of disabled. Only a new exception vector is defined, which is pound HV. And this vector is vector 28, uh, which is injected in just to indicate to guests that there's a new interrupt, which is, uh, or a new uh, event, which is uh, uh, available. And the, the, the interface between uh, host and guest is in a para virtualized manner. So, uh, for example, uh, 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 you could be using, uh, you know, your Vertio or or some say a VM bus feature to have, or, or some kind of a shared, a shared mechanism between host and guest to actually do the the, the actual interrupt injection or queuing thing. Uh, again, this is kind of uh, architected on the APEC thing. So the the HV pound HV uh, data structure which we will see is quite aligned to the epic thing so it, uh, so you, the guest implementation doesn't need to be uh Shidish, can you stop for a moment we have audio issues in the room we'll tell you when we got connected again sorry about this yeah uh, yeah uh, so uh, so the guest behavior doesn't uh, need to be uh, changed too much uh, because the the whole thing is architected to be very close to uh, to the epic behavior uh, in general. Now what is now defined by the DHCP specification? Uh, yes, is there a question? Okay. Uh, so uh, what has been defined by the GHCP specifications is a new HV doorbell page. Uh, the HP doorbell page has basically just two main feeds right now. There's a pending event feed and an EOI assist uh, feed. So the pending event feed is defined as uh, as described in the slide. Uh, you can basically inject. Uh, there's a no further signal to indicate that right now you cannot inject any more 
uh, non maskable uh, uh, interrupts into the guest as the guest is handling a non maskable event. Ish? And can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you please start again with the slides? We just lost the audio and. Oh, 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 should I start from slide one? No, the, just the slide you were at. Oh, okay. Oh. With that slide. Uh, the HPDB page? Say that again? Uh, uh, this is the slide you want me to start with? Yeah, the slide. Just start again with the slide, please, because okay. we didn't have, we couldn't hear you, so. Okay, so the HP Dovel page is defined by the GHCB specifications. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been structured to align with the APIC behavior. And uh, the HP Dovel page has uh, two main fields currently. It's the pending event field, and there's an EOI assist uh, field. The pending event field is where we actually is used to inject either the non-maskable events or vector interrupts into the guest. Uh, the, the first field, the, 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 the topmost bit is basically to just to indicate that right now the guest is, it's a non-maskable event has been uh, injected into the guest and guest is handling it. Until this bit is cleared, uh, the host will not inject any other non-maskable event into the into the guest. Uh, again, uh, nine and eight bits, bit nine and eight is for basic, basically uh, injecting a virtual machine check interrupt or a NMI inject uh, in, uh, interrupt even to the guest. And the lower bits, eight bits are basically an eight bit interrupt vector number, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the actual vector interrupt which is being injected into the guest. Uh, the Dovel configuration is uh, basically an NA, NAE event, so it's a uh, non-automatic event, uh, exit event, which has been defined. Uh, typically, it's uh, there are three uh, new VMG exit events as, again, uh, specified by GACB specifications. So you, you have the main one, which is typically used is the set event, which is uh, where the guest supplies a Dovel page to the host, uh, which is the shared page uh, uh, on which the, the whole, uh, the, which is basically the HP Dovel page, which we talked about in slide five. So this is where uh, the guest uh, does a VNG exit event and supplies the, uh, the guest physical address of the Dovel page to be used between the host and the guest. It's typically uh, the guest will do a in, a in a typical case the guest will do a p validate and make make the guest uh, make this page as a, as a shared page uh, set it into a shared page state and uh, from its uh, point the hypervisor can also do an RMP update to make sure that it's it's uh, set up as a shared page but uh, it's typically assumed that the guest will be doing a p validate and making and changing the guest state to it to be a shared state uh, uh, before making this uh, VMG exit call. And uh, you could use a query uh, to, un to see if uh, the doorbell page has been set up uh, or not. And then the guest can also use a hypervisor provi provided page to actually use as the doorbell page. So these are the new uh, NAE events which are added for uh, restricted interrupt injection support. Uh, so that's uh, the whole flow. Looks Is there any question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, continue with the interrupt injection flow. So, how does the whole interrupt injection flow look like? Uh, from the KVM host side, it either injects uh, the non-maskable event. So it basically sets the doorbell pending event fields uh, to either the machine check or the NMI thing. And then it basically injects uh, through the VMCB. There's only uh, the event injection field now only supports on the VMCB only a new vector. That once restricted interrupt injection feature is enabled, it only supports the HV vector field. And this is a benign exception. It's uh, it's, uh, and the type of injection support is an exception. It's just basically an exception type. Uh, that's the only supported uh, exception uh, or the interrupt event which can be injected into guest now uh, once this feature is enabled. 
in case uh, also it also has an interrupt to inject at that particular point it will also set the uh, hv vector field and then um, again this is just the doable indication the actual event or the actual interrupt being injected for the example the non maskable or the machine check thing or the vector to be injected is at least specified from the in the on the doable in the doable page the hv doable page so here we are setting up the vector to say what is the Epic uh, pending interrupt uh, right now. Uh, at this point, uh, when we get uh, when we enter guest and uh, through the interrupt descriptor table, the pound HV exception gets triggered. The guest could be running with interrupts. It could be a case where the interrupts are enabled or disabled on the guest. So the non-maskable interrupts will always be handled, irrespective of uh, 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 the guest interrupt or disable our uh, guest are interrupt or disable or not. One thing important to remember here is that on HV exception always injects into the guest. It doesn't. Uh, it's it's the hypervisor can just in inject on HV anytime into the guest. It doesn't have access to the guest interrupt uh, flag feature. Uh, if the guest interrupts are enabled or disabled or doesn't, uh, you cannot also check the VMCBs. Uh, 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 control fields like the interrupt state of the guest or something. It's the upon HB always gets inserted. It's up to the guest to how to handle it. Uh, and in a typical case, all the uh, non maskable and machine check in events will always be handled, uh, irrespective of guest uh, interrupts enabled or disabled. Uh, and then it, at that point, because this again, the interrupt comes through through uh, through the interrupt descriptive descriptive table. So interrupts could be actually disabled. Or enabled at that particular point. If the guest interrupts are enabled, it will handle the doable pending event, uh, which is the vector, the vector interrupt, dispatch the interrupt, do an IRS. In case the interrupts were disabled, it's just going to simply do an IRS at that particular point. Uh, when the interrupt get enabled on the guest, so the pawn HP exception will not come again because it's been already delivered at that particular point. Uh, it's only when the interrupt get enabled on the guest, so the, the guest interrupt enable feature wherever the guest interrupts are getting enabled those code paths have to be specifically uh, uh, set up to or programmed in that sense the the, the uh, whatever the code paths in the guest uh, have interrupt enable uh, for example the interrupt enabling code path in the guest have to now check if there was a double pending event at that point and then dispatch the interrupts so this is specifically required because pound HV is not going to come in again. It has already been inserted at this particular point. And because the interrupts were disabled, they were not handled in this point. So all these uh, guest interrupt ex exception or uh, interrupt enabled paths will have to be uh, in a way para virtualized uh, or a hand have to explicitly check if there was a pending event uh, uh, in the dual uh, vector field and then dispatch the interrupt uh, specifically for that. So, so, so it's important to remember that these paths have to be enlightened, or the the guest has support has to be added to handle these particular events at that uh, uh, in those code paths. More specifically, looking at uh, Akish, can you pause again? We lost the audio in the room. I'll tell you when it comes back. Sorry about this. Yeah. Can I, can I go ahead now? Uh, no, we're still we're still trying to connect. Hang on. Oh, okay. You'll hear it when we connect because I'll have a massive feedback loop. Okay. 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 Uh, so should I continue with slide seven or should I go with slide eight now? Um, I think you can go on with the, with the next slide. You are finished okay. with that one. Okay, okay. So looking at the host side uh, interrupt injection flow. So uh, these are the typical uh, uh, callback events or, or the, the callback ops on the KBS. Sorry, Atish, can you stop again? We had another cock up. We're just trying to reach my... Right, go on. Okay. So these are the specific callbacks uh, which get invoked uh, when a particular event has to be 
injected on the on the host side on the KVM side of things. So, uh, so in case there's an NMI pending, uh, the specific callback is invoked. Uh, now there is, as I mentioned, there is no way uh, the host once the restricted interrupt injection feature has been enabled, we cannot depend and uh, reliably check on the the VMCB control flags like interrupt state or the NMI state or something. So we check the Dobell event to see if there's already a pending event inserted uh, or injected into guest. If it's not, then we invoke the set NMI function and which will basically set the Dobell pending event and then call inject HV, which we see below. Similarly for an injectable interrupt, again, the interrupts allow or to see if the interrupts are blocked on the guest, we cannot uh, reliably depend on the VMCB uh, interrupt control state. So, and plus because it's running in a, it's an SNP guest and uh, anything up, up beyond SCV ES guest, we cannot have the register state. So we cannot even, uh, we cannot check the, uh, the, uh, the guest uh, register state to see if the interrupt flags are enabled in our flags or not. So we again depend on the doorbell uh, pending event to see if there's already a vector interrupt injected. If not, uh, the set IQ callback is invoked, and uh, this basically sets the double pending event vector to the next pending interrupt, and then calls the lower level inject HV routine. Uh, no further signal is basically used to indicate that the guest is currently handling an interrupt. So, uh, in case it's not set, and uh, we basically just set it up to ensure we, we are not injecting uh, an interrupt, uh, and the guest is not ready to handle it. And then set just uh, the event injection field in VMC. We can now just specify this benign HV vector, and of the, uh, the interrupt type here is in ex an exception type. Uh, this is on the host side of things. On the guest side, uh, so interrupt comes through the interrupt with the scripted table. Only the bound HV exception interrupt can now come in. Uh, it, uh, basically, it's uh, at this point it's st it switches to the the on HV IST stack is uh, uh, as per the x86-64, there are like eight in, uh, IST stacks. So we use one of the pound, uh, the pound HV exception also uses one of the IST stacks to switch to the uh, pound HV, uh, the, the, to the interrupt IST stack, the hardware based IST stack. And then, uh, in, and then it basically starts handling the exception. Uh, in case the interrupts were disabled on guess we only handle the NMI or the machine check and just leave the handler. Uh, in case interrupts were enabled, uh, we have to ensure we do a atomic exchange instruction here because the guest uh, interrupts could be injected and the guest uh, could be uh, could be injected any, any instruction boundary. So we ensure it has to be atomically, the double pending events have to be uh, cleared and also uh, uh, and picked up uh, atomically to ensure that there uh, uh, that there is no uh, uh, because because of the guest instructions uh, interrupts being injected at any instruction boundary. So this the atomic exchange is uh, in, needed to ensure that. And uh, if in case it was again we check there is a NMI or pending machine check event handle it, and if there is a vector interrupt, we specifically check for vector uh, the system vectors. And we will see uh, there's an optimized way which we try to handle the system vectors here. Uh, it was one way was uh, just calling each system vector specifically, and that was just uh, just too many if and else statements. Uh, just uh, making each and every system vector call here, and then uh, trying to invoke them uh, explicitly, each, like for every, each and every system vector call. So we tried to optimize that. I have a slide for that. We we come to that. Otherwise. In case of uh, all other device vectors or something, we just invoke the common interrupt handler. Uh, there's a specific check which needs to be done at the end of the interrupt uh, uh, or at the interrupt return or the interrupt exit code path. Uh, because now all these exceptions, all the interrupts are being handled by just one specific uh, exception handler. It's, it's, it's an exception handler which is handling all device interrupts is, and everything. So. Uh, the interrupt exit path has to be modified. Uh, on, on the return path, it's a possibility that in case we in, came in through the on HP exception handler through the user mode, uh, it was through a user mode invocation uh, or a user mode context. Uh, it's possible that 
uh, while on the return on the return path we could be actually getting preempted uh, because they will be at the end of uh, interrupt processing there will be like soft IP processing and then there will be uh, 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 there will be some there might be another thread getting activated or uh, ready to run at that particular point and uh, so we need to ensure that so and there is a possibility that this uh, pound HP handler gets uh, preempted at that particular point. And even before we could do an EOI, we get preempted from this particular point. Uh, so th this could lead to conditions uh, which we actually saw uh, where we got preempted and then we did an EOI on an, another vCPU. So we got preempted and we scheduled on another C uh, CPU. And then we, when we did an UI, it was on a on a different vCPU. So it, which could lead to cases where uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the actual uh, 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 on the vCPU which was uh, interrupted uh, was not doing the UI, and it's uh, so the interrupt never got really clear, and uh, uh, we had missed interrupts uh, because of that particular reason. So so we had to have specific handling for that, which uh, I have another slide for that. And at the end of this whole thing, if you check if there is a, a requirement of an EOI, and then we do an EOI. Can uh, you hear me? Yes. I have, a, I have a question to this code flow. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I don't see it. Are you doing any stack switches in, in this flow, or is, is all of this running on the HV IST stack? This, uh, uh, before we switch to, uh, it's just initially we do an HV, switch to the HV IST stack, and then we switch to a specific. Uh, Exception handler, uh, exception stack uh, before we come to HPRO handle exception. So it's so not seen here, but we do switch to uh, pawn HP stack initially, and then we switch, switch to an exception uh, stack before we call this particular exception handler. Okay, so you are switching to the to the right stack depending on which event was injected. Right, right. So the NMI right. handler, hand, for example, runs on the NMI stack and. No, this is just just an exception stack in that sense. It's just uh, uh, just 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 uh, just, uh, just an ex uh, exception stack. It's not uh, it's not a specific NMI stack or something. Yeah, I, I think the NMI handler um, relies on running on the NMI stack so pretty heavily in in x eighty six sixty four. Okay. So. So, so I think for NMI you need to switch to the NMI stack. Not sure about about the interrupts. You at least need to get off the HV stack some, somehow to some other stack because yeah, it's an IST stack. And when the hypervisor decides to inject another event, then you are basically uh, then you are doomed. So yeah, there, there is a uh, there, there, yeah. yeah, I can hear you. So there is a uh, there is a specific uh, uh, thing we need to handle. Uh, because pawn HP exception handler can just come in to at any particular time, right? It's 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 uh, doesn't depend on uh, what the guest state is. So we have to make sure uh, that we have to uh, the, the guest has to ensure that the pawn HP exception handler uh, that, uh, that any kind of nested uh, invocations of pawn HP handler does not corrupt the pawn HP in ISP stack. So there is a specific check we have to do for that to handle nested pawn HP exceptions. Uh, but as far as I remember, we are not switching to an NMI stack or a, uh, or a machine check handler stack. So, we have Tish, we lost the audio again. If you just pause, I'll tell you when it comes back. Uh, can I go in now? No, it's still missing. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Uh yeah, so I was talking. So we do protect again nested HP stack invocation. Uh, there's a specific check for that. Uh, 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 but I am not too sure if we are checking. We are switching to a NMI stack specifically to handle just the non-maskable events. Uh, this, 
Uh, I'm afraid we lost audio again. We're going to have technical difficulties like this for the rest of the talk. How much more is there? Fish, can you go forward? Uh, yeah, I can. I can. I can. can you go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not really sure we are switching to an uh, NMI specific stack uh, because all this is handled on the specific exception stack just for found HP. Uh, but I need to be, I need to see, uh, look at that. I don't think we are handling it in a specific NMI stack right now. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I think it's important to get the stack hinting right here, so to... Um, okay, yeah, that's yeah. something that I... Really okay. And with nested interrupts and stuff, so... Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, I have a look at that. Okay. Uh, again, so we have uh, also because HP is delivered without regard to any interrupt shadows, so there is a... So there, the guests don't have any real control on uh, how to do interaction between halt and interrupt. So typically, this is how uh, uh, when we do a safe, uh, when we do a halt uh, execution on guest, it's typically going to do an STI and halt. And uh, again, uh, STI will by itself not enable. Uh, once the important point to remember here is that once the interrupt flags gets uh, uh, or interrupts get enabled again. The found HV exception will just not come in uh, automatically from the hardware point of view uh, because it's just delivered at any particular guest instruction boundary or something. So whenever the hyper, whenever the hypervisor does it, so we have to add specific checks uh, wherever we are enabling interrupts uh, to basically check for a pending HVDB at that particular point and see if there's any pending events, uh, non-maskable or ma vector interrupts, and handle them before. Uh, we basically invoke halt in this case. Uh, again, if you see uh, more specific code paths, uh, so everything where interrupts are being enabled and disabled, these uh, uh, these checks have to be added. So again, guests can receive an HP notification anytime, and it's up to the guest to see how to handle it. So wherever we are enabling interrupts, say for example, uh, the native IS2 enable routine as part of the x 64 pool, it's it's uh, so Nesti. I will not really uh, once the interrupts get enabled, the found HP exception will not come in at that particular point. So we do need to again add specific checks uh, that there is any pending HVDB event and then handle it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, at the end of the interrupt exit path, uh, the IRET once there's an IRET, it will not clear. It will once the interrupts are enabled again as part of IRET, we. The, it, the point HV exception will just not come by its own. The hardware will not inject it. So again, there's an, a specific uh, handling added for that to check uh, if there are any pending events. Um, Ashish? Yes. Yes. Um, can you go slide back? Yeah. So this check works for the native IQ enable case, but I think it's still racy for the for the idle case because uh, what you're in yeah. the idle case is. When you call the hold instruction, you need to be sure that no events are pending, and it will always um, will always um, be racy. So, what the what, what the pending function needs to do is it basically needs needs to change the the code flow when an event comes in and not return to to the hold. Uh, so, so 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 what are you recommending here? Uh, or you need a specific SNP hold function, which which um, uh, uh, hold itself. Okay. And depending, because you know when or when the hypervisor is well behaved, you know that no new event is is coming when unless you set a bit in the page again, right? In the in the double page. Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. This is something I will have to look in. Yeah. Uh, also, I think there is something. Uh, uh, from the hypervisor or the KVM side of things, where probably there's a halt intercept, and uh, 
uh, I think as far as the halt and step, uh, the okay, uh, who's the host of the hypervisor will check if there are any pending events and will inject it at that particular point. Uh, so, so to to ensure that the guest doesn't miss any events at that particular point, if there's anything pending when the halt intercept is invoked or something. The halt instruction doesn't cause a VC, right? It causes a, uh, it's an automatic exit, basically. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, but there could be an intercept on the on the host side, right? Uh, the halt yeah. intercept could be the halt intercept can be can be still can be still trapped, right? The halt intercept could be invoked, uh, could be uh, could be could be uh, could be triggered on the could be triggered on the KVM side, right? Yes, but but KVM can inject and interrupt before the guest executes the halt, right? And after yeah. the pending HVDB has done its checks. Right. This this could be yes. This could be racy on that on that side. Yes. Oh, you can't atomically guarantee that it was a check and then go into halt. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned about this optimized system vector handling. So instead of calling each and every system vector uh, specifically, now we construct a system vector table. Uh, we basically overload the declare IDT entry. Uh, macro and basically, uh, as part of that macro, uh, we basically create a new help section uh, and they, and set up all the system vectors there uh, as per the structure. And uh, all these are placed into the new. All the system vectors are now placed into this ELF section. And while bringing uh, the guest is booting up, we construct a system vector table and uh, construct a system vector dispatch table through which all the system vector get, get, vectors get invoked. So. This is all dynamically created, it's, uh, and we don't need to explicitly check and invoke each and every system vector uh, separately. Uh, so this, uh, yeah. yeah. Any question on that? Okay. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned, we need to fix the preemption in the interrupt exit code path. So again, we overload the define uh, all the uh, specific macros which generate stuffs for the interrupt descriptor table entries or interrupt vectors. And uh, on this uh, specific thing, like for hash defined identity tree, identity entry IRQ function or the macro, uh, we basically added a new uh, way of exiting, uh, a new function which gets or a new callback which gets invoked uh, as part of the IRQ exit code path, and it checks if it's the, it's a, it's an invocation to the user mode. It's a user mode context or a callback a context at that particular point. And we were handling events. Uh, uh, the H this is our own uh, flag in case we were handling any HVDB event uh, or any vectors at that time. And in, in that case, we don't follow the normal exit interrupt exit path, so we don't get preempted in this particular code path. And uh, and the other uh, normal other kernel based invocations or kernel context invocations. We follow the normal interrupt exit path. Uh, so handle the nested uh, bound HP exceptions. So as I mentioned once, uh, uh, the IST stack is used to handle the nested HP exception. But uh, in a typical case, uh, till this flag is set, uh, the hypervisor is not going to inject another interrupt. Uh, into or any another bound uh, HV into into the guest, uh, and guest only ensures that it's uh, clearing this flag once it's has switched out the IC stack and started and finished the current bound uh, HV exception handling. But there is still a case where there is a malicious hypervisor which can continue to inject bound HV exceptions into into the guest. So there is a particular window between uh, the before the IC stack is switched out and uh, where the nested HV can come in. And because this is again going to overflow the or uh, overlay, overlay the previous uh, bound HP added frame on the IST stack, so it's it's going to get corrupted at that particular point, and we probably will never be able to turn back to the old uh, bound uh, or the or the interrupted bound HP exception at that point. So we basically check in case uh, we are still on the IST stack, and uh, uh, and then another bound HP interrupt has come in. And uh, at that point, 
because the, the iris plane is already corrupted by this point, we just do a panic at that particular point. So this is uh, uh, the way we currently detect uh, nested point HP exceptions. And then the only way to prevent it, the only way to uh, get, uh, recover from it right now is to just do a panic at that particular point. Other, uh, uh, other more, Ashish, more, yeah, quite a bit yeah. over, over over time already. Do you? Um, so I just discussed the last slide. Yeah. So the alternate injection mode is the other injection mode. The in, uh, 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 on top of a strict and interrupt injection, the only difference here is it replaces all hypervisor interrupt queuing and injection with the uh, guest control injection. So this is in a case of a multi VNPL architecture like SVSM where it uh, now injects guest uh, interrupts directly into the encrypted VNSA. And uh, the guest has to go through and the encrypted VNSA to basically get the, the interrupted or the inject, uh, injected event. Uh, we have basically uh, support implemented uh, for restricted interrupt injection right now. And uh, we have both the hypervisor support and the guest OVMF and the guest kernel support. And uh, we plan to post RFC patches for them uh, probably as uh, will be the next step after the SNP host uh, uh, patches are uh, supported and, up, uh, stream and upstream. Uh, but I think uh, we, we have plans to post RFC patches soon. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, so okay. uh, are there any other questions or something? Some more questions, yeah. Three, two, one. Okay. Seems there are no more questions. So thanks, Ashish, for your presentation and sorry for the audio issues. Okay, thank you. And with this, I will, uh, we will close this uh, micro conference. Thanks, you all in the room and remotely for your participation. Um, and have a nice rest of the conference. Thank you.